Good evening. Welcome to the 2023 virtual Great Lakes Fishing Show. We're once again here in New York at the 2023 uh, Greater Niagara Falls Fishing and Outdoor Expo. And I'm joined once again by a guest host. That's what I love about being at the show is we got so many people here that can hang out with us and, and just add some great commentary, add some personality to the show. That's what I'm really looking forward to tonight is some personality. Uh -huh. I've got Captain Pete Alex with me tonight from Vision Quest Sport Fishing. Pete, how you doing? Good evening, Chris. Good to be here. So you just sat down at a round table here. You, you literally just walked in a few minutes before the show yeah. went on air. Uh, what were you talking about tonight? We're talking about spring brought, uh, brown trout tactics, Lake Ontario, of course. Okay. And that's something that I've already seen guys out doing that already. I know there's some issues with runoff uh, that has kind of muddied up the waters, if you will. But uh, I know there's people out there that have already been catching fish. I saw Hajeki's already been out yeah. on Ontario taking some clients out. Uh, tell me about that spring bite and what that's like. Spring bite for brown trout is, uh, you know, you're going to want to find the right water color. That's probably the, the most key to that. You know, the water's cold. You're going to find cold water everywhere. If you could find a, a little bit warmer water, right, or some transition water from cold to warm, mm -hmm. that would be one place to key in. But you're going to want to find uh, some decent color water. You know, mud water is tough to catch these fish in especially right now, they're not as fast moving. They're not going to chase. They're not really aggressive because of the water temperatures. So you're going to want to find that, you know, basically a green to a light brown colored water. And that's probably the most key element to catching these fish right now. So people always say dirty water, but it can't be too dirty. You no. need to kind of look medium dirty. No, and, and there was, a, you know, even Rick was out recently. He had the whole pull lines and run 12 miles because he was trying to you know butt his head and butt his head into that dirty water too long to try and pull these fish and mm -hmm. they just don't go very good and then another you know another one of my peers was out brown trout fishing also banged his head in that brown water all day and uh, didn't have a very good day so we'll have Captain Pete Alex on with us until 8 o'clock tonight. We've got some different guests coming through. Uh, Captain Pete's going to be our guest co-host this evening, though. Uh, we'll spend about 15 minutes just chatting with Pete. If you've got some questions for Captain Pete Alex, uh, go ahead and put them in the comments. We'll try to get those to him uh, before our first guest, Casey Prisco, comes on. But Pete, you've got boats uh, in Wilson, and you also have boats on Lake Erie. So tell me about your uh, out there, your charter, and kind of how it works and, and where you're fishing. Well, the Wilson Wilson fishery is going to start for me sometime in April, probably the third week in April. Lake Erie fishing, I'm actually going to start in March in Presque Isle Bay, mm -hmm. right out of Erie, Pennsylvania. So I'll put my 27th tier in, again, sometime in March, and I'll fish that first uh it's up to about the two weeks in April, maybe into the third, and basically pull that boat out of the water and then transition up to Lake Ontario. Okay. And that Presque Isle Bay, is that a lake trout bite or what are you chasing? There? That's all steelhead okay. in there and the occasional brown trout. Okay. But we do have the opportunity, uh, like our lake trout fishery is starting to kick in then also. Mm -hmm. So if we leave the, the protection of Presque Isle Bay, uh, about eight to ten miles east of Erie, we can find lakers whether they're in uh, thirty to fifty foot of water, or they're going to be out in the uh, what we call a second set of fifties, which is about four and a half miles off the shoreline. They're going to be in one or two places, so we might dabble with them if we get the right lake conditions. But we get a lot of wind that time of year, mm -hmm. so it's prohibitive to, to fish in a lake a lot. So we have that protection of Presque Isle Bay, which helps so us. That keeps you from having the blow-off days. So is it pretty yep. solid as far as booking a date there, you're going to get the fish? Right. We don't run a lot of trips that early. We run a couple trips, a few trips. Mm -hmm. That's all. Tell me about what that program looks like, Steelhead and Lake Erie and that Crocodile Bay. How are you fishing them? In, in Most people, at least up in this neck of the woods, they're fishing brown. Right. So what does that steelhead look like? It be somewhat similar. Uh, bay is... You know, planer board on divers out anywhere from say 15 to 25 or 30 feet to the sides. Okay, and that's a I'm assuming that's a spoon program. Then we're going to run spoons off our divers, spoons off our riggers, mm -hmm. and then our planer board 
program is going to consist typically of a side, which is usually four rods with stick baits, shallow running stick baits, the three inch variety, not too big, hot colors with some natural colors. And then we're typically going to run a side of one and two cores with small spoons. What do you like about those? Tell me about those. About what? About those spoons. They're bite size for the steelhead. Our yeah. steelhead are, uh, you know, a pound and a half on the small size to, you know, occasional five or six, maybe bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, so the bait small. Or emerald, or fear, or all. So, tell me about how those eat up. I mean, you know, everybody likes having the pictures with the giant kings in the summer. Right. But I mean, if you're looking for table fare, it's hard to beat those those steelhead in that kind of age group. Right. Uh, most of the steelhead we're catching in the spring are are two and a half year old fish. We mm -hmm. catch three and a half year old fish, which are, are larger fish, of course. But those two and a half year old fish are those bright silver fish that are from. 18 to 22 inches or so. Mm -hmm. The meat is just primo orange. You know, they're great to eat. They've been eating all winter. They peck away its uh, emerald shiners all winter. So they're like a fat, sassy, really good looking quality filet in that mm -hmm. spring period. So when you get done there, you head up to Wilson. Uh, that's uh, when do you get up to, to Wilson? That's going to be around that third, third week of April okay. into the fourth week this year. We're planning on going to the King of the Lake tournament the last weekend in April, which now we're post COVID and all that. So the regulations have lifted. So we plan on doing uh, the King Salmon tournament up there, the King of the Lake. And uh, I have charters the weekend before that okay. out of Wilson. And then we're going to be fishing for Kings if there's Kings around, which there might be this year because of the, the, the mild winter we've had. Mm -hmm. You know, Kings would be plan A, Coho plan a and b uh browns would probably be plan c uh for those early trips out of wilson all right so you get up there in april um when do when do those kings move in now that's a that uh bite out of wilson you know you're just off the niagara bar you're just east of that uh what point does do the kings really start coming in? so if somebody wanted to come up and book a trip and, and go after some kings up there when's the best time to do that well the last the last couple of years have been early that last last weekend in april uh i fished the last two years and it was pretty much bonsai king fishing mm -hmm. right out of the gate last weekend of april which typically had been a, it typically been a little later like that first week of May, we're starting to get those kings, but you know things are changing. Like this year again, we have a mild winter. Uh, there might be kings swimming around mid-April this year, right. all along the whole lake, all, all along a good part of that Lake Ontario shoreline. You know, Lake Erie's wide open for the most part, which in the past Lake Erie has created this invisible ice water barrier coming to the Niagara River, which mm -hmm. has traditionally kept a lot of the kings on the Canadian side which is the west side of that Niagara River. It almost made it this invisible wall mm -hmm. that when those kings started to come out of that deep water, they started to come into the shallow water, look and eat, you know, things are happening. A lot of them always went to that west side of the river in traditional winters. That means Lake Erie was ice covered. We had very cold water or icebergs coming down, you know, that March, February, March period. And so those kings kind of stayed penned up over there and made for some really good fishing. Now with the advent of these warmer winters or lack of ice, these kings are coming into Canada too, but they're also coming in right to the bar. They're coming in as far as uh, Oswego a few times. Like they had kings in their harbor in uh, late April, early May when we had these mild winters. So the rules change when we don't have a traditionally hard winter. Yeah, so you can see a very different season this year than, than what I think people typically think about. So um, what, what do you think the um, how do you think anglers should kind of change up their strategies when they're out there fishing, knowing that the elements, the things that they're going to be facing and the things that these fish are experiencing is going to be very different than what they typically see? Be prepared. Be prepared. We, we could be catching kings in 150 foot of water right out of the gate. Yeah. Okay. Versus, you know, 50 or 60 foot of water. You know, and a lot of guys aren't going to have their boats ready by that end of April. So you're going to have the guys putting those boats in towards the beginning of May, 
well, let's do the tournament, guys, fishing that, that tournament. Mm -hmm. Guys are going to start trickling in May, and you're going to have this, this two-week advance, perhaps, where, like, and typically they're used to going out in 40 feet and setting their program out, right, and then going from there, 40, 50, 60, right? They might be blasting out to 150 foot out of the gate by then, fishing deeper water. So what I mean be prepared is basically – be prepared to have your, you know, your your diver programs, your your lead core programs, your deeper weighted steel programs already engaged beginning of the this season. All right. We just got a question coming in, and he he wants you to spill the beans already. He's just going flat out right out. Captain Pete, what are your top ten king salmon spoon colors for Lake Ontario kings in the summer? I see, he's looking at his notes. I, I gotta go. He knew this you know, one was coming. See, I'm prepared. See, I got I got a whole list. There's just so many. There's just so many good spoons out there that you know you, and they're all hot. Some yeah. are hot beginning of the year. Some are hot this year. They won't be next year. So, they go out of fashion. It's like clothing, right? I, this, remember, I just said you got to be prepared. Yeah. So I was prepared. So I have my answers already. Pre I'm prepared. Yeah. So some of my top spoons would be uh, the Martell. Actually, we'll call it the Chartel family. We got the Martell, which okay. is a green. We have the Chartel, and we have the Pertel. All three of those are great go-to spoons for me, whether they're from Slims to DWs to Mags. Uh, we have the 42nd spoon. We have the original Carbon 14 spoon, which is a good morning, late, day spoon. Uh, we have a spoon called a Rambler, okay, in a white back and silver back. It's a black spoon with crushed orange and glow tape with either a silver or white back. Really consistent spoon. And we have the uh, a couple of new ones are the UV Ale Wipes. It's a good spoon Dreamweaver came out with. Okay. That was a good spoon last year. We have uh, the Two Face, which has been hot as a firecracker uh, some years. A couple years it's been off. We have a spoon called the Moon Cricket. Uh, those latter two have been really good morning spoons or deep water spoons for me. And uh, those are, and we have a black UV. It's just a n very natural finished spoon. Those are all, you know, I, I hang my spoons in the spoon bucket. Mm -hmm. They're all on deck ready to go. So those are some of my faves. So I got to ask you a question. So you, you talked about a spoon there that was going really good for two years, and now it's not. So what happened? Did all the fish that like that color just get killed and now they're not around? I say that facetiously, but like, how, how does a spoon go from a hot spoon to not a hot spoon? Are you married? I am married. Does your wife always like the same set of shoes every day? Or is she like, does she like to go and shop for a different set of, you know, maybe reds or something? Right. And she that's her go-to set of shoes for that season. And she kind of, the other ones fade in the past. I think it's kind of like that. Really? I do. I, that's that's my comparative analysis for that. Okay. Aside from that, that was a little joke, but uh, that's one of the mysteries that keep the whole fishing game kind of neat. It's right. like, how can a spoon be like dynamite, like put them on every rod, go to every day to uh, like, it's a dud, mm -hmm. you know, the next season or two, right? right? It's just, we, we call them one hit wonders. The one I mentioned, the Two Face, was not a one-hit wonder, um, but it was you know red hot for two seasons, and then it then it kind of faded to uh, an average mm -hmm. spoon for us, and yeah. we wonder why. Right. That's a good question. Yeah, I will say maybe you know water clarity changes and the, the reflection and the way those spoons look change. I would I guess that would be my scientific answer. I don't know if it's right or not, but you know maybe just little differences in just the way the light's hitting it based on what's going on in the water, or maybe you know you have a year where You've got a little more haze in the sky or something in the water. In the, in the water I don't think that's different. it. I think you're 0 for 3. All right. I just don't think that's it. I, I, I don't. You're the expert. Well, we, well, we're the expert, but we don't have all the answers. There you and go. Um, no, it, that's one of the mysteries is why, why you can go from red hot to a, a lukewarm spoon, with all things being the same, water color being the same. You know, we're, we're fishing the same species of fish. Uh, same light conditions like you kind of alluded to mm -hmm. and it's just it becomes an average or a, a not so good spoon all of a sudden it happens on lake erie too yep. you know, not just lake ontario yeah so when we first sat down you know it was taking forever for questions to pop up but as soon as someone asked what your top 10 spoons were the questions went crazy 
So we got some questions here. I like this one because I like eating. So let's go with this one. Uh, this is from Corey at XTR Fishing. He says, Captain Pete, if you could only eat one trout the rest of your life, what would it be? A brown trout. Brown trout? All right, now I'm going to throw in another thing. What if we can add the salmons in there as well? Does it change or are you still going brown trout? Brown trout. Still brown trout. Yeah, I'm going against the grain. All right, I like it. All right, how about one here from Rob Ferguson? Rob wants to know uh, your thoughts on running flasher slash meat versus spoons on longline copper. He says, usually I run spoons. Can you run the meats and flash fly? We run uh, flashers and flies and flashers and meat on our long lines. Mm -hmm. Just the same as a spoon. Okay. Absolutely. All right, now Patrick's going to get back to uh, what we were talking about before. He says, uh, do you have a depth, sky condition, time of day, or sea conditions these spoons relate to? That's a great question. Uh, we constantly change our, our lineup. You know, I call it A team, B team, C team. So we, we usually start with our morning spread of, that'd be the A team, low light spoons with glows, a lot of high biz colors, that'd be A team. Now, as the, as the day wears on, the sky conditions change we routinely go in and start crap canning those spoons unless it's it still fires but more often than not those the a team starts to fizzle then we'll go to the b team the b team is chosen based on sky conditions how deep of water we might be fishing uh is it is it sunny is it overcast still so we'll start pulling those baits off in the morning and start selectively changing those out according to the conditions that are upon us all right so you're chaining things out it's a bright sunny day how, how will those spoons change from what you ran in the morning under low light conditions to now we've got the sun up we will start going to a lot of chromes a lot of chrome back spoons we'll tone down on the glows we'll tone on tone down on those spoons that maybe don't look as natural mm -hmm. in our opinion uh not as gaudy and we'll go to more more of a natural your typical black screens for salmon, some purples, um, and get out of those early high vis glow back, glow tapes, glow everything colors. All right, we've been talking about kind of early season stuff, and I think that's what a lot of people are, are focused on right now, just because they've got early season staring them in the face. But what does that Wilson fishery look like as the year kind of progresses through? You know, those fish in a, in a typical year it starts hot and heavy typical year and then uh, it'll slowly those fish will slowly start breaking up and migrating down the lake they'll go along the shoreline some will go offshore and start migrating down the lake so from from a red hot bunched up fishery you know a lot of fish in one area it starts to it starts to fizzle out where we got to fish a little harder maybe fish a little longer to catch those fish but it slowly starts to fade and you know reality sets back in and we got to work for the fish eventually yeah and you know, it's just primarily because they start to disperse down that lake they follow the temperature they follow their migratory patterns and uh we go from a lot of fish to you know a good amount of fish but you know we got to work a little harder and they start spreading out yeah. you know you might have fish in 60 to 120 and you might have fish from 120 to 350 in the spring actually you have like two bands of fish at times inside and outside so a guy like you who takes a lot of notes is really prepared. Do you like that? Do you like it when the fishing gets hard? Is that fun for you? I do. Yeah. Except in tournaments. Except in sometimes tournaments. I don't like it on tournaments when we get that curveball when I'm not prepared. Right. But day in and day out, I think uh, I would rather have it tougher bite than a bonsai bite. Mm -hmm. That's all. You like the challenge. I like the challenge. I do. Very good. Well, speaking of challenges, our guest is here. He's been hanging out here. And uh, we'll bring him in. It's Captain Casey Prisco. Come on in. You get the gold microphone. No, no. I, I, Pete, how are you, Chris? Good. I'm glad to be. Listen, two things before we start this. They can't nope. hear you. You got to oh, stand in front of a microphone. Go around, around the back of it. Yeah. Do you have a, a red or yellow flag to throw in immediately? Pull up Trevor, a little. I'm about, yeah. Um, I do have a question, Pete. I gotta get it on my pocket. Uh, would you sign my stealth core? I uh, you look how a, young you look in that picture. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can see this. We're right, I gotta move up to that camera there. I'd be honored to sign your that your spool of stealth core. I'm gonna put that right in my trophy room. 
Pete it's a, Alex. It's a must-have product, by the way. It really is. <sighs> yeah. Guys, one other thing. The cameras aren't the greatest here, but as you can see over the years, Pete's been on the lake for a long time now. He's getting older. I got these for you, buddy. Thank you. Keep your immune system up. I need you out there as we much just, as possible. We were just talking about going on a high vitamin C diet. There you for, go. For, okay. for the same person. Um, yeah, they're for you. I love you. Know, don't say I don't do anything for you. Uh, vitamin you stole D those. Also. Those are mine, by the way. <laughs> See, that's a, that's the kind of guy, you know, he's, hey. he's an East End guy. That, yeah. that's well, shows you we are. East End, like, on no, listen, corner, I was so. thinking about you. Yeah. He don't I mean, he might have been looking at him. He had some hair shag going on over here. I didn't cut my hair because I didn't want to make him look any worse than he was. And then he goes and tricks me and gets his hair cut, shaves nice. Well, one of the things about Pete, and, the, and again, if you people, Casey asks if you've seen him, um, Pete has been fishing the trips. So that's wow. that's something that you enjoy doing, and I think when you fish the trips, you gotta have a little. Oh, if you walk around the show and you see all the fly fishing guys; they all got it's the, the stream look. It's it's yeah. the that's the center pinner and the fly guy look. So, My good buddy Brett calls it the dude look. You're one of the dudes. It worked, but I I felt compelled to get cleaned up for the show. Yeah, you look good. Thank you, you do look good. Stop touching my leg. I'm nervous. <laughs> it's, 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 it's vibrating. Yeah. You know? So we got questions for Casey as well. Uh, you can drop them in the comments. Starting to get a few few more questions, but uh, we've been talking uh, Wilson, oh. and that's the place we did some fishing last spring. And uh, you know, we've we've heard from from Pete on the Wilson thing. Uh, what's up with you? Well, what's your, your thoughts on the Wilson thing? I think it's going to be amazing. Um, I think it's going to be early this year. I really do. I wish I could get there sooner. Um, I'm going to be there from May 1st into second week of June. Um, but I think the Kings are going to be there mid-April, right on through all May. And uh, I really look forward to the second half of May beating up on the hoes. Yeah. Those we cohos like are so – yeah, coho fishing so much fun. If you guys haven't done it, um, there, one I heard Pete say he likes brown trout better. Eating. eating no eating, way. Eating coho is so much better than brown trout. You're out of your mind. He's getting old, guys, like I said. He's got the brownies in his neighborhood. Yeah. If you all like the same thing, it'd be boring, Chris. Right. right. Oh, That's yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Pete. Think, think, that, think that through. I thought about it, yeah. You got it. I understand what you're saying. Yes. Right. Um, but, no, I think it's going to be a really amazing season there. Um, I'm excited to go there. I'm bringing three boats this year. I have a buddy of mine, Russell Gahagan, one of Pete's buddies, um, coming out there. And uh, I'm looking forward to really putting a beat down on the fish again this year, right alongside Pete. What? It, what would you say your best three spoons are? It doesn't matter, morning, midday, or afternoon. Like, just if you had to pick three, in fact, why don't you do a morning, midday, and then I know you run the PM trips often. Yep. So give us your one, two, three lineup for morning, midday, and PM. For Kings? For Kings, sorry. Not Coho's. Pete's got me running a Chartel and a Pertel, which I've done pretty good on last year, the mag size. Dreamweaver, right? Dreamweaver, yep. I am, I am a Stinger Pro staff, and I do run a lot of Stingers. Um, but I also run Dream Dreamweaver. I run Moonshines. Uh, I'm going to tell you, in my business, I'm there to catch fish. So if they're not biting something and I need to run something else, I'm going to run it. I'm going to give you an honest report. That's what I'm running. So um, I like a Carbon 14 in the morning. Um, I like a NBK Mag um, Stinger. There's Green Jean Mag Stinger that I like out there. Um, to be honest with you, I don't put many spoons in the water. I prefer meat out there uh 10 rods nine will have meat um or as me and pete like to call them studs and uh that's how i like to fish the kings and wilson all right we're getting some questions and uh a lot of these are addressed to you pete just because when they came in you were the well, only they don't, they don't know casey prisco so well, yeah i think they'd be good to get good it's, just yeah, it's, it's okay I'm, I'm all right with that <laughs> all right so <laughs> david stanischewski wants to know uh do you add scents to your spoons, and if so, what products? I, I use Mike's Atlas scents. Um, I, when the bite is good, I do not. You know, uh, when the bite's tough, I do have a tendency to, to pull. I call it the juice, um, and I will scent my. I'll, I'll scent my meat. My, you know, I add some uh, scent into the meat heads, and I will scent my spoons as well. 
Casey? Yeah, same thing, Atlas Mikes um, or Potsky. They both make some great scents. Um, I did see, I haven't used it yet, but I did smell it a few minutes ago. Soko Bates had a, a herring scent. Um, I don't necessarily do anything with my meat, but definitely on spoons um, or on flies. If I run them, I will put some scent on, um, especially out there. It's a little dirtier water, so I think having that scent in the water can definitely trigger some more bites. All right, follow-up question, David. He says, uh, how fast do you troll with your flashers and flies for summer kings and why? Uh, flasher flies. I'm a 2.4 to 2.8 flasher fly guy on average. On average, I change the leader length of my fly to adjust to my meat program. Um, so they're going to be a longer fly at a slower speed, 2.1 to 2.3. Um, late season when I get our staging kings or late summer, I guess when you get staging kings, sometimes I'll keep them shorter and go faster, 2.8, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9. Um, I think that's a loaded question, to be honest with you. The fish are going to tell you what speed they want it. And once you figure that speed out, duplicate it. And the only way to do that is with a fish hawk, Chris. All right. Yeah. So do what the fish tell you to do. Yeah. Yep. Listen Replicate to the fish. It. Don't listen to Pete. I have a question for him. All right. See, do you remember this day on the boat? He, he made it for me one day this spring. So I got this shirt for him right here. That is so true. That show up good. Pete's uh, Big John center rigger did kick my ass out there. Is that a bad word? Borderline. It's a little too late. Yeah, okay. I apologize if I offended anybody with that word. Um, he runs Big John's, and they're sloppy. And, uh, you know, first of all, I didn't want to touch the thing. So it was, I was like, yeah, it's brutal. It's just brutal. Get a cannon, you know, get a real rigger. I like, I think Pete should hold that shirt up again. Hold it up. I, you know. It's pretty good size, Pete. I it's think, a two X. Yeah. It's a two X, and uh, that show up on the small. What does it say in the front? Oh, it has Vision the, Quest. Uh, I'm going to wear that all the time. <laughs> it has the Vision Quest. Leave no fish behind. Yep, motto. Well, I can yeah. tell you, he does that because I've been behind is, him and catching fish. So <laughs> that's buddy Casey. I, Pete, wear it's, it it's an honor. I will. I will wear it proud. Make sure you take your vitamin C. I want to see you in May. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we got that out of the way gift no i think actually you've received all the gifts so no i want well, yeah no, no, you get the vitamin c i know earlier you're asking me his nickname right you're yeah. like what do they call this casey guy i said superman right it was a name i gave him so yeah. that's wild man right why there why is he superman how so, did he get that yes i, I um i'm getting my fly and my it. spoon back it's about time i got this for casey <laughs> so everybody can see this is it's a Superman doll. It's a Superman doll with an atomic fly. You know, his favorite fly, a friend of ours, Tom Allen. So we got that, and we have a Michigan Stingray, you know, and he's got the the pose going. And then I made him part of the Grey Goose fishing team right yeah. here at, on the back of the cape. I am honored, Pete. So, you know, we could, we could, why don't we leave that right there? You know, my birthday is not till May, but you have just gone above and beyond. Is there more? Well, yes. Oh, and my then, gosh. I'm so excited. Rumor had it you're bringing. A captain from the West this year. I am Russell Gahagan from uh, Salmon Candy. We'll be running one of my boats. Uh, he does a lot of salmon schools, and he's uh, going to come do some schooling so, on the water. So we're we're you know the dock guys and I got together and we said you know so we got we got Superman and then we got to have Captain America, which will be Russell. Okay, <laughs> this will be. Russell. I am loving this. So we got on the dock, and you know it's going to be my dock. So we got Captain America and. Uh, that is Superman terrific. running boats out of Wilson till the first part of June. I'm going to get some 4200, and I'm going to put them right on the pulpits of my boats. And as I troll by you with my limit, you can watch me going back to the port okay. with my cape flying out. Okay. You have a six-hour trip. That's why you're going back in, not because you have your limit, probably. No, that's okay. Bob, that's not true. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's because your time's up. No, that's not true either, Pete. Is you need to get on. On those vitamins you're really getting delusional in your old age i do no, I, I do appreciate the gifts we we work together all spring we, we have a lot of fun as you can see it's all in jest but yeah we do communicate a lot 100 percent. the communication goes like i leave the dock half hour early before him and it's like pete are you on him yet where should i set up that's how they communicate exactly how it goes so there's so, two things in wilson i've learned one -way street. look for vision quest boat and if he's not steady scooping you listen for the loudest boat out there it's real excitement. And you go to that guy, Bob Songen. He's on him. 
Bobby you, boy. You know when he has a bite. Oh, yeah. You don't have to be nope. close to him to hear when he has a bite. Nope. Well, he has to yell like that because that boat has no exhaust. Oh. It's like straight pipes. That's why he's so loud. You know that, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, his it's ears. Loud. His wife is so sweet. I met her today. She's Lisa. the quiet. Yes. Lisa. What a sweetheart. Quiet spoken. Mm -hmm. You know, she irons and steams every one of his shirts that he wears. It's it's about balance. You got Bob and you got Le Lisa. Well, that's what they say. A good marriage needs balance. And they have it. They've been married a long time. And she still loves them. She told me. Good team. I got her a nice shirt. And I thought maybe I had a way in. But she loves them. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I knew this was going to be good. And I knew there would be very few questions needed for this segment. But uh, we've got some questions coming. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's, what we got? Let's take some, do some Q&A here. Uh, Glenn says, a question for Casey. Meatheads with the larger slots for herring. Thinner slots for alewives or just the shorter meat presentation? I don't run alewives. Um, it's it's all herring. Uh, I think um, the scent of the herring is something that I like, so that's what I run. I run king heads, I run diabolical heads, and I run reese heads. Um, I do think there's days that they pick in on a certain head with the roll uh, when it's tuned. So once again, fish are going to tell you what they want. If you have a rig out there and it keeps going, Look at it. Is it a race head? Is it a king head? Is it a diabolical head? Some days it doesn't matter. Some days it's easy fishing. The you know, fish make you look good, but other days you need to pay attention to that. So I would say, you know, I definitely have all three types of heads on the boat. All right. No herring or no lives. You just uh, mentioned Russell. So Jim wants to know if Russell makes you uh, wash the spoons with fish soap. <laughs> no. Um, speaking of Russell, so I had to explain to him last year what a rod holder was because apparently they don't use them in Wisconsin. So Well, they make them out of wood. I don't know what they make them out there. but So he brought a new guy this year, and that was the first thing the kid asked. He goes, is, is Casey going to yell at me for not using a rod holder? Yes. Yes, I am. They're Canon dual access, not big John. Canon dual access rod holders, and they're amazing. Put your rods in them. All right. That, so, that was... Uh, oh. That did generate a lot of complaints on the dock is when he'd get back in after fishing with Russell. Yeah. The first BITC was, I can't believe Russell lays rods all over my boat. When yeah. He just lays them on the road. Yeah. Who does that? You yeah. know, and I you said, think, I, I don't know, but he, it's after, your guy. Yeah. So work it out. With I him. did. It's your guy. After he's, a week okay. of it, you think it'd be good? Well, no. He's, he's, Two weeks later, yeah, Facebook yeah. post, I look at he's back in Wisconsin. Two rods crisscrossed in the back with people on the boat. He's better this year, though. I sent him a cannon dual axis rod holder a couple weeks ago. I can't hurt. Like, obviously, you talking to him didn't Well, no, he, I sent him a dual axis rod holder a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Every night we do a little rod training. Rod and rod in the rod yep. holder training. He's down to like 13 seconds. He can get the rod in and out and back in. I don't want to hear complaints on Doc. There will be no complaints about Russell. Okay. Not about that. His anyway. name is. Oh, Russell the Love Muscle. No, 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 no. Oh, look, he already missed this. Oh, sorry. Captain America. That's Captain America, please. Oh, I thought, yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about his prior, prior, prior uh, job. Before he made tackle, he was in porn. No, we're moving forward. Oh, okay. Yep. I had a feeling this was going to go off the rails, and it, and it has. I haven't swore yet. You haven't. I'm doing good. No, you said ass. And that's not a bad word. You're right. All right. Can I, so, I, do we have time still? Yeah, we got time. Serious question. Uh, you're like in this full bore. No, I give you, I call you Superman because you're, 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 I had to look these words up. Yep. Oh, wow. I, I call it a combination of hyperactive and OCD. So it's like that combined. That's about which, right. Which, which is why I call you Superman. You run a lot of doubles, which they're tiring. I hate doing doubles. Like, I don't do many. Well, you're old. Yeah, that too. Yeah, you're old. But I never do like them. Right. Even though well, you're old. But so he called you Superman because you, you got a lot of energy hyperactivity, OCD, all, all that mixed into him. So that's the Superman. So the question is, the the serious question, like the future, like you're full bore in this three boats, gung-ho, and I actually think it's impressive. So what, what's the next 10 years do for Casey? What's, what's that look like? To be honest with you, I never thought I'd be where I'm at right now. And I'm thankful every day. That I love and work. The same, like you that have the same passion in the morning, anyway. In the afternoon, he's sleeping, naps. He's old, guys. I'm working. I'm he, working not, job he calls too. it work, work nap. Job you know, whatever he wants to call it, but he's napping. Um, honestly, I, I picked up a fourth boat. 
Um, I don't think I want to go more than four boats. We did about, well, we did a lot of charters last year. I don't have to mention numbers, but we did a lot of charters. I think I, this year I can do a few more. Um, realistically, I'd like to to uh, maybe have another five to s five years of this and go to Costa Rica. Five years are good, though? I think so. You're going to be our dock buddy for five more years? Maybe. I don't know if we're buddies. Let's not go that far, Pete. We're friends. Yeah, yeah. Like friends. There's a difference between friends and buddies. Like buddies, like a big commitment, and I'm not ready to make that with you. You, not yet. Let me have a few drinks. We can talk about it. You know, I really know what you're bringing to the table for me anymore. You're getting old. The yep. big John Riggers. I seen the planer reels that you use. Oh wait, they're not reels. They're said You make your uh wood from some hey, hey, some guy's hey, house that burnt down we're we're tierra guys we don't oh yeah tierra you know right we i will operate that way yeah yeah we don't I, brothers. I'm gonna we're, get, we are technically brothers i might buy you big brothers john otter boats so you can actually have talk to each other about, right. about our boat our equipment right well i'm we're just both shimano guys yeah so everything on boats on pete's boats amazing besides his planer boards and reels i'm working on them though he's a work in progress we're gonna get there you know i have to give him something to pick on me about right oh uh, yeah yeah it, and it is, uh, I ran into both of these guys on the dock at Wilson last spring. Uh, I think we were going to go out the next day, so I just happened to kind of hang out. And, and it was, it was just like this for an hour in the back of each other's boats. And some poor devil had a boat between the two of you. And Hank. God only knows <laughs> what ended up on that guy's boat with you guys throwing stuff at each other. Nothing. I can promise you, Pete. Not Hank's boat. Nothing. Nothing. That's a, that's a no-go zone. No. That's the cleanest that's here on Lake Ontario. Road. Best maintained. And Hank is a he's a hell of a guy. We, he really is. We don't go over Hank's boat. We go around Hank. Yep. <laughs> Rule number one. Yep. <laughs> Hank is a great guy. He came out with us for a day. We yes, he did. Very smart. Very very smart guy. Great fisherman. He is. So, he absolutely he, is. He is the cleanest boat in the harbor. He's well, most well maintained. But uh, good guy. Good yeah. captain. Yeah. Sure. Well, we already had you got to pull out your list. I'm sure Casey has a list. Um, somebody just asked, uh, you name your top 12 flies for Summer Kings Ooh. from Atomic that work best for you. I, don't I can give you 12 flies. What I can tell you is if you go on Atomic's website, he has an actual package already put together. Let me give Atomic a plug here. It's called Dirty Goose's Picks. I believe there's 12 flies in there that he's packaged together to give them to you at a good price. Um, it comes in a nice little container. Um, in that package will be Ultra Green Glows, Mirage, UV-190, Live Line Mirage, Shredded Hammer, Pro-Ams, B-Flies, Stud Fly, Sweet Pea, TG, I believe. Um, I made the video. That's a, You know what that fly is, Peter? Yep. Okay. You just named it. Yep. Um, I made the video that's, for the that's flies that's probably two years ago or three years ago during COVID, and Tom actually went and made it. Um, so if you go on Atomic's website, he has it on there for you guys to uh, purchase. Question, is that... I know it's like a universal fly package. Is that primarily east end, west end? It, everywhere. Everywhere. That's the it's flies you need. That's the flies you need for Lake Ontario. Okay. Granted, there's some variations, guys. There's some live series. There's some uh, shredded series. There's glows. There's UVs. But those are your colors primarily that I'm using and a lot of guys that I know use and are very successful with. All right, Jim asks, uh, he'd love to get into some browns west of the river and that's something that, that you do in your home port uh yep. your last guy what west of what river i don't know this is west there's of a lot the, of rivers jim the river how about what he's asking for is tips on browns you got any advice for sure him? just what time fishing? uh early season i would say look for colored water uh the warmest water you can find in colored water stinger spoons um stick baits regular size Same. yeah regular size stinger spoons um later in the season you're going to look for temperature and bait you know, and, and work from there. But early season, if you find any type of water that's coming in, most times you're going to have some color there, and that's going to trigger the browns to, you know, bite, and it'll be a little bit warmer. Awesome. Well, we got Casey coming back tomorrow night. Casey will be hosting. Uh, he'll be in Pete's chair tomorrow night at uh -huh. five o'clock, and we'll be bringing you back on the show as well yeah. tomorrow night. So I, I didn't know that. We'll just uh, be. I told you he's I old, guys. Another example of how old he is. Yesterday he was told less than 24 hours. Old boy here forgot already. Sweet. It's okay. It's okay. 
So we'll do this all over again tomorrow night. I'm going to walk him to his hotel room tonight so he gets it there safe, Mrs. Alex, just so you know, so you don't have to worry about your husband while he's away. He is getting old. I mean, truth be known, he might have actually had like a little trail shaved into his forehead that he could follow with his finger because some of the guys do that in their haircuts. Pete might have that going on underneath his hat. You'll find your way home. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. Easy, ah, he does. Easy, I told easy, you he does. He's got something easy, underneath that hat. Easy. And he's going bald. It's, Old guy. It's my cheat sheet. Oh, wow. You didn't cut the top. You just cut the sides? It, it's, what the hell? It's valued real estate. I think they call that the clown cut where I come from. It's Look at that. It's valued Dude, real estate. Valued real estate. Valued real just estate. Just take it off. Bald sexy, that's they I, say. That's what I told the magician. Easy, easy on the top. Well, that, they didn't touch the top, apparently. Easy. They just didn't touch it. Did you pay for that haircut? And that, I get, He stuttered. He didn't pay. Pete's really cheap. <laughs> no, I took care of her. I took care of her. Pretty. Yeah, okay. Good. Good. I hope you didn't pay more than $10 for that. Good Lord. All right. If any, hey, if anybody story. knows, we're gonna be back tomorrow. But if anyone has a good, where you from, Erie? If anyone knows a good hairstylist in Erie, please drop it in the in the comments. We can get Pete there because he needs it. It's bad. I don't know if you can see it with the camera, but that is horrible. Jesus. All right, JC Briscoe. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having we'll me, guys. Tomorrow. He's gonna co-host we'll tomorrow. See, we'll see you, Chris. We'll... <laughs> Bye, Pete. <laughs> so we can get back on the rails now. Casey's out of here. We're going to bring in Doug from Fish USA. Oh, that was fun. No. I knew it was going to be exciting. Gonna right I knew it was going to be no, sitting back. I'm going to put them on the front of my boat. I'm not kidding. You want them? No, hold on to bring those. Till spring. Yes. Deal. All right. Gonna, he's going to bring those to Wilson. Doug Straub, come on over. Thanks, guys. All right. Take care, Casey. Doug? Howdy. How are you doing? Great. You? Good to see you, man. Excellent. Doug, Pete, I adjust this you. mic here. Casey sat down and Probably moved it all around. I can imagine. Get that fixed up for you here. Yeah, I think that's going to be a tough act to follow with that character. Yeah, I you like, just... Hey, nice I like that. Yeah, looking good. You look good. Yeah. Good. Comfortable. You just sit back and kind of hope for the best when he's here. Yeah, just... Yeah, Hopefully it didn't come off the rails too bad. I, I caught the end of that, which is yeah. pretty good. It was pretty good. Sure. Awesome. Hope Love the Superman. That. Yeah. So, Doug, uh, you work for Fish USA. Tell me a little bit about that, what you do there. Yeah, I'm the senior director of merchandising, handle all of our products that come in, um, and everything from rods, reels, lures, um, over Sarah our buying team and our e-commerce uh, production team, everything that goes on our website. I've uh, been with the company for just over 12 years. And uh, it's been a fun ride. It's been awesome to see and love supporting the Great Lakes region and uh, want to continue our growth across the entire country. So basically, your job is to pick out what Fish USA is going to have mm -hmm. as far as the product line, what they're going to carry. Yeah, absolutely. So everything from our anything from walleye, salmon, steelhead, uh, our ice fishing assortment. And we've got a tremendous team. You know, it's not just myself that's doing this. We get a lot of input uh, from our entire team. Our, we, we tap our pro staff like Pete. Um, Rick Hijeki is another pro staffer, Roger Hinchcliffe, who's around here. We, we work together in really trying to, to build an assortment that's the best in the entire country. You know, from the major players to small niche brands, we try to co cover everything. Yeah, what's that like for you now? Um, those small niche brands, it's like a growing trend in the outdoors. You see it in hunting, you see it in fishing. How do you find those, those little small regional brands that just have that real rabid following and pick those and go, this would be a good brand to bring to Fish USA. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, you know, with the power of social media now, you can get access to, you have the ability to get access to a lot of those brands very quickly. And, you know, whether they're, they're doing a social media post or an, a sponsored post, there's a lot of ways that we can find out about it. But I would say that's the number one uh, way that we find out about new products. It's really not people coming to us necessarily. We're always looking, you know, my job at the end of the day is I got to go find a lot of these products. So, we're very active on social media, just looking around um, and trying to find these types of products and niche brands. And, you know, it's it's I think what sets you apart. You know, there's not a, not every you know big box retailer is going to carry these smaller niche brands. And I think it's important to be able to offer a, a variety of, of brands like a Shimano um, and, you know, smaller brands that, you know, are just more regional focused. So we're talking about buying stuff right now, at least from your standpoint, what you're going to bring in. Uh, to offer to customers. But how about selling? I mean, it, we were, you and I were talking earlier today, we had a little meeting, we were talking about just different markets that are growing, places mm -hmm. where you're seeing, you know, start seeing more and more orders come from. Where are kind of the up and coming fishing 
I guess, regions and areas that you guys see? Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's COVID has been really a wild ride and everything we saw from COVID and really the challenges of getting product, it really didn't matter what you had, it was a matter of what you could get. Uh, but now that things are really subsiding, um, I really think that there are certain categories, you know, I'm, we're seeing growth in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we've partnered with a, 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 a group of influencers called Addicted Fishing, and we're seeing tremendous amount of growth. And it's really cool to see because what the Great Lakes is very different than the West Coast and the products that they use. You know, I'll use Pro Troll as an example. The colors that we use here in the Great Lakes on Lake Ontario, Lake Michigan, are very, very different than what you're going to see in Washington or Oregon. So it's really cool to see the different uh, types of products and the different applications. And does any of that blend into each region? It's it's kind of cool to see, and I'm I'm really excited to see how it all comes together to see if there's some crossover that we can really, you know, br bring the two uh, two coasts together a little bit and and uh, you know share some of those different tactics and techniques. Yeah, that's what's interesting is you know we're fishing Pacific salmon here, and they're fishing Pacific salmon there, yeah. but the way that we fish them very different, are very different. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's it's just so cool to see. You know, one thing that I see out there is a lot of people use single, you know, a side wash hook. You very rarely see that on the Great Lakes. It's all treble hooks. And I think you're going to see more and more people say, how about that over here? Or how about this over there? So it's just awesome to see. And I'm really excited about uh, watching the whole category grow. Is that something you think that's because of social media? You think a guy that maybe is going to go out and fish on Lake Ontario and he pops on YouTube and says, like, how to catch more salmon. And all of a sudden he's watching a guy that's fishing in Washington State and goes, oh, that's kind of an interesting idea. And then those things kind of meld together. I mean, is that how yeah. this is happening? I mean, I think the power of YouTube, Facebook, Instagram is you have everything is at the, your fingertips. It's it's a one click away uh, to be able to get access to all these different. You can learn so much in such a short amount of time. And I think that's we didn't have that. You know, social media didn't exist until I was in college. And that was 15 years ago. I think uh, the, to hit your top, your, your question, I guess, is, you know, years ago, everybody went to sports shows because you couldn't go to Facebook or YouTube to see instructional videos or to see the products guys wanted to show you how, how they caught the fish, what they caught them on. Talk about taxes. So, you know, seminars were like a lot more popular back then. People would travel long distance to sit through these shows. Now, going back to the point about social media and the tools, I, mean, I, I could sit my butt at home and flip on the YouTube channel and, and see how West guys troll for salmon, what they're using, the color schemes, how far they're putting them back, you know, on the water stuff. Like it's it's like I'm sitting in a seminar anymore. So a lot of that, you know, west to east knowledge, and it's probably east to west somewhat too, is, no is going backwards. But it, man, it's sure shortened the curve for a lot of people, and. You know, it's in your living room now. Before you really had to travel, read a magazine, or basically travel to sports shows to, to get this information. So it's changed a lot. Hey, you've really been working on your YouTube channel. You've been putting <laughs> a ton of stuff out there. What do you see when you're when you look at your analytics? Where are people watching this stuff? I'm sure a lot of it is from Great Lakes, but outside of the Great Lakes region, where are you seeing those viewers coming from? I can't answer that. I don't really pay any attention to it. <laughs> I just. I just throw my YouTube videos on there and, and yeah. send it. I don't. Uh, it, I don't really get into the. You know, you don't. You don't find at the end of my YouTube videos like me, right? right. I, I don't really don't care. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna find me through the search engines, or you know, your buddy says, "Hey, Pete's got a good video on how to tie a knot or something that that's beneficial." That's all I need. I don't need to make you know twenty cents on a video. It doesn't matter. I, I'm doing it. Part of it's because of my passion for the fishing business. Mm -hmm. Part of it's just my free time or nervous energy time. I like to just do something somewhat creative that might help people. But I cracked the 200 video mark the other day, which is uh, the goal is to keep doing that as time allows. But it's really just fun. It isn't about the likes and, and how people from wherever look at my videos. It, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, I don't care. Yeah. I'm doing, doing this people to really get something else it's not ego not you know have a good man uh, we just talked about things that 
to shorten the learning curve and to help people. Mm-hmm. So that, that's my that's my gig or the reason I do that. Really. All right. Well, I see you brought a product with you. Mm-hmm. You guys have some new stuff this year. Uh, you got a new trolling rod. So yeah. Tell us about that. No, we're super excited about the, our new line of rods. It's called Fish USA Flagship, and this here is our. This project, literally, uh, we got our first finished product about 10 days ago. Uh, it landed in our warehouse, and we are super stoked about this. Um, this is a project we've for all over here. It was a, a very integral uh, part of the process in designing these rods and testing these rods. Um, and you know, there's some unique features about it. You know, the, the things that I, I really wanted to take into consideration with these rods were, at the end of the day, a trolling rod's a trolling rod. It's really not about sensitivity. It's Really, the one I see in a lot of amazing certs uh, with their guides, and these are all solid stainless steel. And uh, that's really the big, I would say, the biggest difference. And that really the differentiator is all of our trolling rods um, moving forward that come out of this line are going to be stainless steel, with the exception of a wireline series uh, that is going to have a ceramic insert and it's made out of zirconium. And the reason for that is singles or seven strand wire will cut through a stainless steel guide over time. It will groove. We found out the hard way last year in testing these and we moved to a different uh, guide and they held up terrific. And so we're super excited about that. They do come with a twilly tip already uh, installed on them. Uh, that's another differentiating factor, but you know, it's this is just step one in the journey. And I really have a new appreciation for folks that go through product development and the whole testing it's these things don't happen overnight. It is a very long, long period of time that it takes to actually develop products. And there's a lot more to come from Fish USA. You know, we we pride ourselves on our name and the product that we put out there, and we're going to continue putting product out there that we feel is is as good as anything out there for at a reasonable price point. Yeah. And that's that's our long term goal. And there'll be a lot more to come from us. Yeah. So you got these rods this year. You showed them to me when you were over there. Um, the question everybody has when you come on the product is how much does it cost? Yeah. So what are we talking about for yeah. three new trolls? So price? there's two two prices on the rods. The wire rods, both the nine foot and the ten foot, are going to retail for one hundred nine ninety nine, and then every other rod in this series is going to be seventy nine ninety nine. So we're at the I would say at the for a trolling rod, mid to higher end uh, on a, on the price point, but I'm very confident and very uh, I'm very happy with this rod. I think it's a, a tremendous value, and uh, I'm, I will stand by my word on that one. And I'll, I'll second that. You know. I, I had the privilege of going through the the, the uh, steps of helping field test them, you know, and trying to narrow this down to the diameter maybe or the, the, the guides, maybe it would to tweak the guides, the handles, things like that. And uh, they, they put together a really nice, Doug did a great job designing it. You know, he put his heart, heart and soul into this whole thing. He took personal ownership of it to make sure it came out right. And uh, I think they put a really nice series of rods together for the great lakes troller or west coast or whatever but just a really nice and i think that they're very competitively priced and they're a, an attractive rod so i think they did a great job with them what else do you guys have that's maybe a new thing maybe not something that, that you guys develop but what else are if someone's going on fish usa and they're thinking about getting ready for the season what's yeah. something new that you guys brought in this year that, that you're excited about carrying yeah, I mean, I think from from existing uh, manufacturers that we work with, we, you know, we're going to continue to bring in custom and unique products from Dreamweaver. Um, if you stop over at our booth, we've got custom Moonshine spoons, custom Dreamweaver spoons. I'm really excited about the, our new planer board line. Um, actually, planer boards that we're building. Pete is actually helping us uh, build these planer boards. Uh, they're unique. Uh, they're different. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot out there like them today. So we do have them over at the booth. But there's going to be there's going to be a lot more to come. And I'm super excited about some of the projects that we're currently working on. And and uh, it's just a, it's a process. You know, I'd love to be able to push things a lot faster, but it, you just got to make sure it's right. Yeah. And that's one thing that I'm trying to stay focused on is just make sure we get it right the first time sure. so we don't have problems on the back end. So I think when a lot of people around the country think of Fish USA, they think of it as kind of an online pro shop, mm-hmm. a place they can go online, pick out what they want, get it shipped to them. Um, but you guys go out and work some shows. Yeah. Uh, what's it like for you and – what do you get? I mean, obviously you sell stuff at these shows, but what are some other advantages for you to come to something like this? At the end of the day, it's for me, it's, you know, we are, we're a retailer. So yes, sales are important, but it's just the, the interaction with, with anglers uh, that you don't, 
I don't, I don't personally don't get to do every day. You know, we have our customer service team and our pro shop guys that they're interfacing and talking to the angler every single day. This is my opportunity as a, as a purchaser to talk to the actual fishermen and what they want. I've heard people come over and talk about the rods and, and they love the rods, but do you have this? You know, three people come and say, wow, I didn't think about that. Maybe we should add this, this product to our line. And that's where you just get a lot of valuable information from the anglers. At the end of the day, they speak and they, we need to listen to them. So this is my opportunity to really get engaged with them, talk to them, because like I said, I'm not I'm not on the sales floor every day hearing everything. A lot of that information does get funneled to me, but this is my personal opportunity to be able to talk to people and listen to what they want. Just get a chance to hear what the average person is. And I think when you are in it, like Pete's in it, like you're in it, like I'm in it, like we have one perspective just because we see it, but the way the guy actually is pulling his wallet out and spending his money on this stuff, they may view that product completely different just because it's a different, it's just a different experience for them from their end of it than what, what we see. No question. No, I, I completely agree with that. And sometimes I, you got to remind yourself, you get tunnel vision sometimes. It's, you, you need to really listen to the, the anglers and not just what you're, you know, we all have our personal biases and our tendencies, but you really, at the end of the day, it's, it's about what they want. And, you know, looking at different price points and looking at products and say, does this product make sense or not for, for our company? Sure. We got a question here. This is from David. David's been active. I've uh, been watching a lot of our shows this week. He wants to know uh, Fish USA selling any new Fishhawk products for 2023. Bought his Fishhawk X4D from Fish USA three years ago. Uh, any new technology coming out? What I would say, David, is we're always working on stuff. We're always developing stuff. We've been developing stuff for years. It just comes down to what that timing is like. And we just, at this point right now, we're not sure when new things are coming out, but we're always working on stuff. So i um, happy that you're happy with the product you got right now and, and hope that that works for you for quite a while. And at some point we will have new stuff. Absolutely. Right now we just, we don't know when that's going to be. Yeah. Um, obviously with COVID and everything that's been happening in the supply chain, like it's throwing, it's, throwing oh, no a lot question. of plans and there's just, there's always new stuff that we're working on and new stuff we're thinking about. And it just comes down to finding yeah. the right time where we can bring the parts in to make it in the right time to when it makes sense for the market as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, even across the board with all the, the vendors that I we work with from the Shimano's, the Daiwa's, the Fishhawks, whoever, I, there's a lot of really cool product that's in the works across the board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can't share everything that we do know, but it's it's exciting and it really for every angler, there's so much stuff that's being worked on right now that will be coming to market. And uh, it's really, it's fun to be a part of and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, so it's just kind of, finding that sweet spot where, where it works for everybody. Um, tell us a little bit about just what that day-to-day -day is like at Fish USA. I mm -hmm. mean, you're you're a big company. You're a company that ships all, you guys ship all over the world, mm -hmm. all over the world, uh, lots of different types of fishing and, and angling enthusiasts that, that do business with you guys. Um, what does that mail day look like? Yeah. <laughs> no, see, so, you know, my day is, uh, you know, it's all over the board. You know, I, I spend a lot of time with people, you know, there's, there's a lot of human involved. It's not just about the products. You know, it's a lot of it's about employees and working with, at the end of the day, we're still a company. So you got to, you know, work with people. Uh, it's not just about working on products or the, the new thing on the website. There's a lot of uh, components to that. But, you know, I, I would say my my time on a, on a normal day is very, very divided up into certain areas. You know, part of the day is, I, you know, I'll, I'm an actual, I'll buy product for our company. Mm -hmm. I have a handful of lines. Um, part of my day, a lot of part of my day, a lot of my day is actually spent in meetings and just talking about, you know, plans, where we're going in the future. How do we want to continue to grow? Um, how we want to expand our, our physical footprint in our pro shop? What are the things that we can do? How can we better, you know, employee engagement, the whole nine yards. It's, it's really, it's not just about buying products and, and what you see online. There's a, that's a, it's a real company. And, uh, you know, what I would say about, about Fish US is we are in the tackle industry, we're above average in the terms of the size and the number of employees that we have. But at the end of the day, we're pretty small. We have a very small family environment and we take try to take, take care of each other. You know, that's in our pro staff, you know, people like Pete, they're an extension of our family. And we want to continue to grow and, and have people be part of it. Um, I think it's really cool that that Fish USA was started in a garage uh, by our owner. It, it was started from nothing, from scratch, 22 years ago, 23 years ago. And, um, you know, I don't know that a lot of people know that. There was a lot of heart and soul uh, that was poured into that to get to where we are today. And we have a long way. We have, we are not where we want to be. 
Uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, we want to continue to grow, uh, continue to you know, keep the company growing in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, I think that's important. And having that homegrown feel is just something that's really cool and it's fun to be a part of. Very cool. Uh, one more question before we let you go here. This is from Nick Cook. He says, uh, what's your best-selling salmon gear? Best-selling salmon gear? Uh, I would say our number one brand is definitely Dreamweaver. Okay. Uh, Moonshine is up there. Uh, it's Michigan Stinger. Uh, but I would say Dreamweaver is is by far. I wouldn't say it's by far, but it's it's definitely the biggest uh, in terms on the Great Lakes from flashers to um, spoons, the whole nine yards. Just so they're a really great company. Uh, yeah, we we work very well together. Uh, they do a, a lot of unique custom product for us, and we're going to continue to keep doing that. Very cool, Pete. Anything else? Yeah, I'm, we let them go? I'm curious. Do you know which state you ship? The, I guess the the highest dollar volume volume to annually. Or do you yeah. Have to tra you track that? Yeah, absolutely. Which, which state? Is Michigan. It? Okay. It's not Pennsylvania. It's you not track that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was, it was a curious when I was thinking about the yeah. questions, like good question yeah. to ask Doug. That are like good information. Yeah. Michigan. Uh, Michigan's our number one. You state. know who's like two, three? New York. Okay. New York, Pennsylvania. Okay. A Great Lakes region is really our. I was our, curious if it was anything on the west. There's some. The there's uh, yeah. California is in our top ten. Okay. Um, Washington is up there, um, but yeah, Great Lakes region is our is our home territory, and but we want to continue to grow. Uh, down south in the southern bass market, and we're going to make some efforts to do so. And it's been fun, but yeah, Michigan's it's, Michigan's unique in that there's just it's so diverse. The, the Great Lakes in general is just very diverse. You know, you got you know small great smallmouth fisheries, great walleye fishery, great salmon fisheries. How was the ice fishing season so far? Sucked, <laughs> absolutely sucked. No, that's, that's a that's a subject. It's a running it's a sore subject. Yeah, uh, he's got a, he's always he frets over ordering, pre-ordering, right? Based on hoping the fall, the farmer's almanac, right? Excuse me, that that nail a hard, cold winter. So you know you got to prepare. Back yep. to the prepare thing and order ahead, so you have product on the shelf. Then we get a winter like this, right? And then him and I talk, and I'd say, "How's the ice fishing sales going, Doug?" You know, I'm on a stream. You know, in February it's 50 degrees, so right. I, yeah. I, I crack him. I give him a crack, and he just. Rah, rah. Yep. He's, well, sales. The sales will be coming. You know, yeah. right. <laughs> close yeah. It's it's been a tough year for the guys. How do you predict it? Tough to predict. No, it's a tough. It's a tough business. It's I say it's feast or famine, and uh, but it is what it is. I mean, it, you, you want to be prepared the best you can for it, but at the end of the day, we can't control Mother Nature. It's uh, it's it's yeah, like it a tournament. You should have exactly, went left and said yeah, exactly, you went right, exactly. right? And how do you know? Yep. You just based it on your best information at the time, and you go with you make the call. Absolutely. All right, Doug. Appreciate you coming. Thank on, you so man. much for the time. Having you on. Appreciate Great it. Great discussion. So, really appreciate your time. Thank you. We've got another guest Thank uh, you. ready to go here in the bullpen. It is uh, Nick Glosser. Nick, come on around here. Hmm. Nick, welcome to the Nick. show. What's going on, guys? How are you? you? We're we are ready to go, man. Glad you could mm -hmm. join us. Sure. Anything I can do to help. So you in the program are uh, noted as special guest. And yes, what that so. means is we didn't have you booked before the show. I went up to Pete and said, hey, Pete, we need a guy for the show. Who should we have on? And he's like, I got just the guy. It's Nick Colosser. I'm like, well, tell me about this guy. And he, he kind of gave me the story. So why don't you give our audience a story about how and you, you and Pete get to know each other? So... Long time ago. <laughs> Long time ago, 2007, Pete needed an observer for the uh, Spring Deluzy tournament. And I just happened to be the guy. And I was put on Vince's boat. Yep. Yep. For two days, I fished with Vin and learned quite a bit. That was my goal to do it, was just to learn. You know, Vince I wanted Pirelli to. On it. Yes. Vince yeah. Pirelli. Vince Pirelli. I hope Pirelli up on a good boat. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and my goal being there was I wanted to learn how to salmon fish. Yeah. You know, I was a grew up walleye fishing my whole life. Salmon became a passion. I mean, they're just a different species. You know, they're totally different. You know, so, yeah. Nick answered a forum, a forum post. You know, yep. Vision Quest looking for an observer for the tournament, and, and he responded. And I didn't know him. You know, I'm like, hope you know, hope he shows. You know, like right. that, that yeah. deal. And uh, so that's how our, I guess our first me, our introduction yep. was as an observer many years ago. Uh, you know, with so as the story goes, sitting there Sunday after the weigh-in, um, 
Vince, after sitting on a boat for two days, learned I fished out of Sam Port in Olcott, and he needed a mate for the next day. And he asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, sure, why not? I was in college at the time. I was landscaping in the summer. I mean, who's, who enjoys that, you know? So he asked me if I want to do that this summer. We went out, ran a brown trout trip. Well, it's walleye fishing, you know, stick baits in shallow water. And we were done at 830. Went back to the dock. He sat me down and asked me if I want to do it for the summer. And here so, I am. so then I see him maybe maybe at a weigh-in or something a short time later. I'm like, what are you still doing around here? Nope. He's, oh, I'm working for Vince as a mate. And I'm like, wow, that, that was pretty cool. Like the marriage got made and I was kind of part of that yep. somehow yep. inadvertently but but part of it so we see each other often right so, well yeah. tell me how that went i mean vince has got a reputation uh you know he's he's a pretty hard hard core angler so it was for you what was that like it, it was pretty cool it's it's learning on the job for sure yeah. um a lot of the customers have said i've softened them over the years yeah they have said that yes so it was you I guess so. I mean, not that screaming, yelling man that we know you can hear from boat to boat out on the lake. Um, I'm glad you said that, and I didn't have. No, well, that's a. <laughs> he's intense. Yeah. You know, he's he's intense. Right. You can learn a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I couldn't ask a better way to learn how to fish the lake. R yeah. Rumor was, I think it's true that Nick had to sign an agreement. Um, like a, a sworn to secrecy type agreement, like yeah. whatever you see here, touch, smell. Pete, I can't tell you the answer that. that. He had to sign that we can't, you can't talk we about can't, it. it doesn't go past the it's boat. It's part of right? the agreement. So it's part of the agreement. And I think yeah. he's, he's done a good job holding that. Uh, there was no end date to that date, agreement. Right. So yeah, yeah. we're just teasing about that. So there's a lot of past though. And I see it all the time on the forums and message boards. People that were probably a lot like you and that. They liked fishing. They liked being around it, and they wanted to get in the business. And they didn't know how to do it, and they're like, "Hey, you know, I think I want to become a mate. How do I do that?" Um, I think your story is actually strong because people can kind of see how that works. But what would your advice be to somebody who is in that situation where maybe they're just out of college or something like that, and they they think they want to do something like that? What would be your advice to somebody who's thinking about getting into being a mate? Honestly, I got lucky. I mean, I had no intentions of it. As far as someone getting into it, contact captains. Guys are always looking for someone to do it. Um, we have a, you know, I now have, have, a, have had a license for eight years. We do have mates under us. We just get local kids in town that love to fish and they want to do it. Some do it for longer periods of time than others, you know, do it till they go to school. But as far as getting into it, contact the captain. You know, it's the best way. What Get your the, name out there. What are those expectations? And Pete, you can answer this question too. Maybe, maybe both of you guys be really good at answering this question. What is the expectation as a captain when you bring a mate on? What what makes a good first mate? Well, uh, probably just like any employee, you know, you want them to be on time, punctual. Uh, you want them to integrate, and talk to the people a little bit. You know, uh, you want them to not sit on their butt. You know, you want them constantly on their toes, uh, not being lazy, and then uh, continue to, as the day progresses, just, again, engage with the people, be active on the boat, and then, you know, when everything's done and over with, is uh, to engage in doing a good job, you know, making good use of the time. Put the baits away on the ride end, if, if you know, clean the boat up, do a good job, right? And, and, and end, it, end it like the day began, everything orderly, boat clean people like to clean boat so vin you know. sat me down gave me what his expectations are and as you know as i got more into it i kind of developed my own things of doing things i mean i'm i'm down at the boat an hour and a half early every morning we leave the dock at six i'm down there at 4 30 every morning um I've, I've been late twice and once i got in a car accident on a ride there my first year and a second and one other time i just slept through the alarm and i was late and that's since 2007 i've been late twice but i'm down there at 4 30 in the morning you know Rod's ready, tackle ready, anything I got to retie, go through. I do admit I do got to scrub the boat a little bit better, and I'll I admit that one. Yeah, I, I do slack on that a little bit, but I I keep up it throughout the day. You know, it's not a pigsty or anything. I keep on it throughout the day, but a little bit more cleaner would be a better thing. Okay. But it's everyone, you know, 
you're part of a guy's business. He makes us living this way. You make money this way. You got to respect that. Got to be good with clients. So you have to be able to go to clients. So what would you say was your most exciting moment over the years on the Thrill Seeker, whether it was a big fish that got landed or, or a customer's expression or a tournament win? I know you fish tournaments with them as well. So if you had to pick out maybe one or two things that were like, wow, that, I'll remember that to like pass. You know, what, what, what's the moment? I had quite a few moments that stick out. Pick a couple. Pick a couple. We ran an afternoon trip. One one moment that sticks out. We ran an afternoon trip. We we're uh, longtime friends of Vin's. Wanted to bring out his grandkids, and we were fishing stagers, and we ended up with a quad. And the last fish to hit was a 22 pound brown trout with an eight year old kid. And that fish sticks out to me a lot. That kid was excited. They ended up getting mounted for him. Um, yeah, that, that that was cool. And seeing a smile on everyone's faces. I mean, we get six, seven guys a year. That's, that's the first fish they've ever caught. Mm-hmm. Okay, I was part of that. You know, and to me, I love the tournaments. I'd fish every one of them if I could. But when you let put a fish on a deck and that guy's holding it or that lady's holding it, that kid's holding it, that smile on her face means more than any of those tournament wins, any of them. And one other thing that I like is, is I like this – it's a science. As much as going out there fishing, okay, what's what's going to bite next? Are you going to put a fly down? Are you going to put meat down? Are you going to put a spoon down? I like figuring out the fish. That's my favorite thing of the day. And there'll be times we'll have both boats out, and I just – we'll be going, and Vin and I will be talking, and all of a sudden I go blank, and it's just because I get so into figuring out the fish. And it does frustrate him once in a while because I just not – you know, if he's not catching fish or not on fish, I just don't – you know, I'm not communicative with him. And, I just get so into that. Figuring out the fish is probably my most favorite thing to do. Mm-hmm. And when a customer gets off that boat and says that day was awesome, you know, any, any any smile from them just makes it all worth it. Yeah, so something that, that Pete brought up, it's something that I've talked with Casey about a lot, um, but it's not all about the fishing. And it's I know mm-hmm. it's something that a lot of people who are really into fishing, they want to do this. They want to be a charter captain because they want to fish for a living they want to know everything about fishing and know how to do it the best but you brought it up and a lot of this job that you guys do it's really about it's a people business. yes and yeah. it's even especially if you have a day where things aren't going real well in the rods like entertaining those people making sure they have a good time and and just connecting with people so that when they go fishing with peter they go fishing with you the next time they want to book a charter, like, hey, I had fun with this guy. Maybe today we didn't catch a ton of fish, but it was fun being out with them. Um, what's that like? And how do you how do you kind of hone that skill to really kind of learn to um, connect with people and just walk off the boat and, and everybody feels good about the situation? Well, that's a good question. I, I think, uh, first of all, it's got to be about the experience, uh, not about what the cooler says, Okay. Um, even though that's part of it, but I think making sure that people have a good time, that you're you're friendly, that you, you know you got, you know you you have some humor in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, orient orientate the people of the boat, you know the whole thing, and just make sure they enjoy really the whole thing, not just what they're reeling and catching that day or what, what they go home with in their bags. Right? It's have fun with the mate, have fun with the people, kid kid around with them. And so part of it's the, the people aspect of that, right? It's just en- them enjoying you and you enjoying them. And the, the fishing sometimes comes secondary to it all. Um, I think at the end of the day, they might not remember what they caught, but they're going to remember if you were a jerk or you were like, I'm not going with that guy because he had no personality or he was, he just didn't treat me right. So I think you got to be aware of that as, as a captain. And I am, you know, I try to make sure. Everybody has a good time. And, you know, fishing's fishing. You know, not everybody kills them every day. Right. And one, you got sometimes you got to turn a tough day into. Yeah. Just, Positive. Hey summer. guys, it's one of those days. Let's just have fun anyway, and we can joke around a tough day because we all have them once in a while. But it's it's really that they walk off with a really fun, good experience. Well, one thing, and it brings me back to the trip I had last year. It was actually as a captain, it was my worst trip. I only came in with like three fish, and it, it was a tough bite. Nobody was catching fish, and. I've ran that group for a couple years now. They come up for two days. And last year we smashed stagers down off the river. And we were fishing in front of Olcott. And I came up with three fish for six customers. 
And they walked off the boat and they said, Nick, don't worry about it. We want our two days next year. And they go, we saw how hard you worked. And if they see how hard you work, you're not just sitting there, you know, even if you're sitting there communicating, entertaining them, but you're not trying to catch fish. You're not changing out lures. You're not, you know, looking at a new spot. If they see how hard you work, that makes up for a ton of stuff. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a very good point. Real good. So you, you were a mate for a while. And then what's that process like going from I'm a mate to getting the license, becoming a captain? What's that transition like? Other than, I mean, other than you got more responsibilities on a boat, you got to get the license. I mean, I took it with the local company. I don't know if it still exists anymore. Um, I've had it. I think I'm on eight year. I think this is my eighth or ninth year, eighth year, I think. Um, it's the same stuff. You're just a captain now. You're in charge. Do you remember your first trip? The very first as trip? As a captain? You went out. Yeah. You, I do remember my first trip as a captain. Um it was one of those days, and you know how we are. We fish everything. We leave the dock when a lot of people won't. And you're the same way. So it was rough. It, it was, was terrible. Yeah. It was started out calm in the morning, but it ended rough. And it was, yeah, it was It was in May, I think, May or June. And it was good fishing. And we had this family come in, and it was it was one of those nasty days, those six to eight days. And I go out, and it's the first time I've, I mean, I've driven a boat, docked a boat, no, just, but I'm in charge. And I remember the group, and we caught, there were six of them, we caught six fish, and I think it was a four-hour trip or five-hour trip. And I'll tell you right now, it was uh, it was all spoons on the riggers, and I'll even tell you the lure. It was the, uh, what I call the Matt Yablonski. It was the uh, green skirt. Green skirt. The green skirt. All of them on one lure, they were all kings. Each one of them caught kings. Or I think there were two or three matures involved. They were they were ecstatic. They were super happy. They loved every moment of it. And they've, I believe they've been back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was my first trip. I remember leaving the dock, Vin sitting there in a the boat taking pictures. I'm like, what <laughs> the heck's neat. going on? That's you know? Neat. Yeah. That's neat. That's neat. Oh, yeah. That must have made you feel pretty good. It did. Yeah. It made me feel a little bit better when I got back to the dock. Right. It sure did. It sure did. Chest puffed out a little bit? No, I'm not that type of person. And sometimes, you know, I'm not yeah. that type of person, but it felt good, you know, ran a trip. Everyone is safe. You know, that that's the first goal above everything is safety. In my mind, it's it's safety, especially when we fish days. A lot of people won't. And, yeah, I still remember the one girl holding the fish on a cooler, her smile. It was a dad with four kids, I believe it was. And, uh, yeah, it was it was cool. It was, it was exciting. So what's that like? And that's the thing as a charter captain, you know, a lot of times you have repeat bookings. You know who the guys are. You know what the personality is like. But sometimes you get these new people in, you have no idea what, what they're bringing a lot of times. So what's it like, what's the difference in what your job's going to look like from, hey, bachelor party to dad with four kids? So how does that change your day and, and what what your day is going to look like as a charter captain? Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> when it comes to the fishing, yeah. I, I do the same thing all the time okay. because it's one less variable. If you, you just go out there to catch fish, you know, if I can go out there and I can – pound kings everybody wants to pound kings why not they're the greatest thing that swims you want to catch kings but if it's got to be brown trout if it's got to be steelhead if it's got to be lakers fine you know it's it's that i do the same thing all the time jokes change you know how you talk to people changes you know it's like that has to you have to you have to watch your people you have to learn your people all right pete well for me i i judge my crew okay you know age experience bachelor party wild ones okay and then i judge the water okay so if if you got the family going on i'm gonna make sure everybody's i'm gonna ask them three times did you go to the bathroom we're good right you sure you did your you got everything you know we got time the camera the iphones once we pull out they can't go back so triple check with them guys so make sure they got everything. Make sure they got their snacks and beverages. Make sure that, you know, I warm up. If they're kids, we, we warm up to the kids. I'll have my mate work with the kids a little, teach them how to reel properly. I might go and tell the dad, you know, if fishing's good, it might be one thing. If fishing's tough, I might say, if little Joey is going to get the first fish, it might be I understand you want 
100. If you're not concerned about Joey Heavy, then we're good. But I'm just going to let you know, maybe a rigger rod is good for Joey, right? Because it's short, sweet, and a little easier to control, less reeling. So I'll, I'll think of that whole plan, depending on, on who I got on the boat. And if, you know, if, if, if there are people who I don't think have very good legs that day or they're inexperienced and it's going to be too rough, you know, we might say we're going to give it a shot for a while, or I might I might power down the lake ten miles and or eight miles and take a big one way troll, so they got the best comfort ride. Even though it might not be the direction I want to go, but we're going to get to Dan and make their make their make not have a bad experience and half of them get seasick. Right. So I kind of look at my crew and condition and we go from there. All right. Very good. Anything else? No. Not unless fun. you have any more questions, I'm good. All right, man. We appreciate you stopping. Thanks, guys. By. Yeah, anytime. Thanks for good seeing in. you. Yep. You guys yeah. have a good day. People want to want a book? You can just look them up. Vision Quest, right? You and you and Vince. You can get up. No, thanks, right. guys. Take care. See ya. All right. All right. Hope it wasn't too Next cool. guest is already right right here in the bullpen. Bring him in. It's Mark Kulak. Mark, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Mark? Good, good. Good to see you, good man. To see you too. We've talked to you a few different times on the show. It's nice to have you right here in person. In person, yeah. They let me across the border. I, that's pretty nice too, huh? <laughs> yeah. So they didn't look at your background or anything when you tried to get in. It was very easy. I think the uh, I think the the U.S. border guy, guy yeah. he must have been a fisherman too. I said, I'm going to the fishing show. He's like, next, next, nice. yep. So yeah, yeah. Next, nice. yeah. cool. Uh, we wanted to bring you in today. I mean, obviously. Uh, we had Doug here from Fish USA, Fish USA there. Yeah. You got some stuff going on too, uh, projectsalmon.ca. Tell us about that. Yeah, so it's interesting. So, uh, you know, for the, some people know, some people don't know. Like, I uh, obviously I fish out of Toronto right now, but I lived in Vancouver, British Columbia for a few years. And, uh, you know, when I lived out there, I was amazed that I could go, forget even the tackle store, I could go to a, I can go to a hardware store and I'd see a wall of salmon gear, like as, as big as you can imagine. And then I moved back to Toronto, and I, honestly, I was disappointed. You know, I couldn't find the stuff I wanted as uh, as a fisherman. Uh, you know, very, very peaky when it came to uh, tackle and in stock. And so I started uh, probably back in 2015, doing a lot of custom tackle for mainly charter captains, mainly tournament guys. And then over time, it just became something. And it became something to the point where I couldn't keep up through Facebook message and those types of pieces. So in February, actually, it's basically one year. Uh, one year uh, next weekend, I, I, I launched Project Salmon.ca, which really is, it's my tackle line where I started out doing, you know, call it custom painted flashers, um, you know, in, in a few different types, you know, an eight inch uh, fin flasher. I run, the, I've also got the 10 inch hot fish, which is a Canadian flasher uh, in a fish shape, but uh, a 10 inch with a little bit more of an aggressive action. And then from there, really got into the bait heads. Uh, and, and just recently brought out, you know, I've got uh, I've got divers, I've got anchovy heads, and and really starting to build out into, uh, I call it the Canadian salmon ang salmon angler's dream, where you can really go A to Z, almost everything you uh, almost everything you need. So anchovy heads, beads, terminal tackle, um, a, a one stop shop. You know, you know, I love the Fish USA site, but it's you know we get this border in the way, we got exchange rates and those types of things. So trying to really build something for the for the Canadians. What's what's been interesting though. Uh, for those that may not know, uh, the Canadian dollar is actually really weak right now. So I'm actually finding I'm doing a lot of sales in the United States because, um, it's yeah, it's a good price. You know, you're, the U.S. dollar is worth a dollar forty Canadian right now. So um, it's it's funny how it works out. Yeah, I'm doing lots of Canadian sales, but I'm actually shipping quite a lot across the across the border. But that's really where Project Salmon started. The other thing though is I, it was about trying to make sure they had patterns that worked right so the patterns i sell the patterns i'll run on my charter boat they're the patterns that you know other captains are using the, pa the patterns that the tournament guys are buying i, I don't want to have 300 400 different SKUs that sit there it's about having you know 50 60 patterns that frankly i can have complete confidence in uh and, and will feel and stand behind so yeah that's what project salmon's all about very cool. How do you come up with this stuff? I, I know you're fishing. That's going to be your yep. answer. I fish them. But, like, so does that mean a bunch of them end up on the scrap heap? I mean, you, you um, have to be a, a guy that's going to go out and, and just try different things. Well, how does that work? How does that development process work? So, yeah, yeah. Some of them some of them don't work. And the good news is they don't end up on the scrap heap. You, you pull the tape off and you start over okay. uh, when you've got all the machinery and the paint to do that. Um, 
you know, I, I think the one thing I try to do and uh, with, with a lot of my tackle that I'm making for people, I try to make sure it's something that I, I believe can, you know, call it last the day. So, you know, if, you, if someone goes to my website, they'll notice a lot of my patterns. They've, they've, they've got UV and they've got glow. So I, I try to go for the best of both worlds. I like to argue maybe it's like I have a hard time making decisions. So I want something that works throughout the day. But that, that's a big part of what I try to do. But yeah, it's a lot, it is a lot of, a lot of trial and error. Um, you know, I think like many of us, we, uh, we love the color green. So that's a great color on Lake Ontario. But, um, you know, from there, really trying to mix and match and, and see, what, see what works. A lot, of, a lot of variations too. So, you know, I, I may have a, a pattern I love and then I'll do it in, you know, I'll do it in black, then I'll do it in green. And, you know, then I'll bring an orange one together. And, and that's some of the things I've, I think I've learned over the years from, fishing on Lake Ontario, but also when I fished out, out west, you know, it's, it's the same fish. So, you know, we're, we're very infatuated with green on Lake Ontario. So the guys out in, on the west coast, but we were using a lot more orange, a lot more pink to catch Chinook or Kings out there. So starting to bring some of those colors in and they work. Do you make your friends order a minimum quantity when they come up and say, hey, could you, can you do this for me, Mark? I want a little of this. I want a little of yeah. this. And it, so is it like no onesies you need no to onesies so tell yeah me, tell me what you i can't tell so you what know you what tell when i do that you know so it's interesting they might be telling me that yeah too. it's interesting so uh when i do the custom stuff now that's not on my website typically it's like half a dozen or you know or preferably a dozen because it takes time i can't be cutting tapes and painting ones and twos right. uh let alone trying to you know mix the clear code and such um but you know it's that's to answer your question that's also part of the developmental process right when you're working with all the you know, this network and they know like, I, you know, if Pete asked me for something custom for Pete, I'm not going to sell it to everybody, but over time you might, you know, take something you learn on this flash or on this flasher and you blend it together. Right. So yeah, I typically, I do, you know, six plus when I do the custom, but the other thing I find I do a lot of, so, uh, I know on the Canadian side, we love the white lightning. That is a, that is a staple paddle for us on the Canadian side. You know, I'll take the white lightning, and I'll then blend that with like a UV super frog. So now you've got the UV frog on one side, you've got the white lightning on the other side. So that's a lot of what I've been doing with, um, with you know, call it Project Salmon. It's a bit of a mashup, right? Where I take two patterns and bring them together and put them into one. And what do you see when you use that, take it out? Do you feel like you really do have the best of both worlds? Or is it like one of those things where you take like a steak and you put peanut butter on it? You know, That's just wrong. This doesn't really work. So Yeah, I, I'm dead against putting peanut butter on a steak. So I would never do that to, sal to salmon tackle either. Right. So, no, I, you know, I, not everything's going to work, right? Sometimes you look at something and, and say, is it, uh, <laughs> is it truly better? You, you know, uh, you got to let the fish decide. The other, the other joke, and, you know, some tackle manufacturers might not like me saying this, but... Uh, before you catch the fish, you got to catch the angler, right? And that's the colors, right? That's that, that's the patterns. But uh, yeah, there's absolutely some patterns that you know just may not work, or someone doesn't have confidence in, right? Like I, I think about a good buddy of mine back home. He's got this one spoon. Uh, I think it's a sexy veggie spoon. It's called. He swears by that f spoon. He catches all kinds of great kings. I have never caught a fish in that spoon, no matter how many times I put it out. <laughs> that goes back to the question about the spoons and how they could change and this whole kind of dynamic yeah. of i have flashers on my boat that you know casey or somebody will swear by it and you know i got the same fly behind it i got the same gig going yep. on and i'm like this thing sucks okay <laughs> I, I just can't it just doesn't work for me yep. and then like why spoons get hot and why they're not sometimes yeah. is another we're not really sure it's good that we don't know yeah it's actually it's probably good right it keeps it keeps it a little bit of a mystery yep the whole thing and then why chris can catch him on that and why why i can't well even last you know? year's stud pattern may be a complete dud next year exactly yeah that's so it's good for tackle people though yeah right yeah. you got to keep creating new things maybe yeah so how was your fishing on the north shore last year would, would you rate it on average um when it was really good it was amazing when it wasn't it wasn't it was Bad. I would be yeah, honestly. I had a great season uh, from a charter perspective. Uh, very fortunate. I worked with a bunch of great captains out of the Bluffers Marina. You know, yep. well, Pete, you've been there many times. Uh, I work with great captains. We stay on fish. Uh, plus, uh, you know, I've got a father who's retired and fishes every day for fun. So if I'm, out, I'm not in the water, someone's feeding me intel. Some every day I'm looking at what's the winds doing, what the temps are doing. We stayed on it. Um, it was good. I'd say. 
I feel like 2022 was a smaller year for us from a fish size perspective. Yes. Same. Um, Same here. Yep. Same. But, you know, when I say it was good, it was good. Like, you know, 35, 40 fish, five hour trips. Um, but then what we That's noticed, great, uh, that was amazing. Yeah. Actually great. Yeah. But then when it was bad, it was because, uh, you know, typically it's, and you use these words a lot, it's the ice cold death water. That wasn't last year. Last year was the soup. Yeah, soup last water, year it was yeah. so warm. Like there was uh, probably two, three weeks where like, if you weren't going to put your riggers down below 120 and your diver and, you know, clip on mag divers with extra weight and, a four or five hundred copper, you weren't going to catch fish, yeah, that's right? Tough. That makes it tough, and that's tough, especially you know, you know, when you're running a charter boat, you're trying to get a, a nice spread out there, and, and you're you're stuck with maybe a six rod spread because you just otherwise it's tangle fest, yeah. right? So that was yeah. we went through a lot of that last year. I'd say uh, uh, for the recreational guys, I think it was tough because I know there's a few guys I helped out last year didn't they didn't have a mag diver in their box. It was like here, take this. Your standard dive is just not going to get deep enough. So we, we had that for about three weeks last year. Um, for some reason, the last two years, we've got a big tournament. Uh, you know, you know the tournament, the King of Kings in the summer. Terrible fishing. Absolutely terrible fishing. Um, but, you know, that separates the men from the boys. you got fine fish. Um, I think the challenge is being when, you're, when, when you've got the tough fishing, you've got a big tournament, but you're also running charters. You're then going out to the blue zone, trying to pick up the steelhead or rainbows, the cohos right. for the customers. You're not necessarily getting the intel you need for tournaments. So that was a bit of it's a bit of a catch twenty two. You know, you you want to be able to work, but you want the intel for your tournament, and that's where you got to you kind of pick one. Um, but overall, it was a, overall it was a great season. Um, huge cohos, huge cohos. So that was nice. You know, for me when I'm when I'm taking customers out, uh, there, there's nothing better if I'm going out deeper and you know picking up you know. 14 15 pound pound cohos on a spoon yeah. uh that's a, that's a lot of fun you know they're, they're not fighting a ton of gear so right. yeah it was a it was an okay season i'd say i consider it a good season because i think i was on the water so much with a great network but the average guy it was had, tough. Had a tough year it like, was that, a really tough season for the yeah. most part too the yeah. average guy you know the weekend guy or yeah. a guy that comes up twice a month really it wasn't dialed in, no. so it's a huge disadvantage. Um, yeah, for them and, it is, and that's and it's funny, you know. I, when I first started, I do every time I do a, and I think you do something similar every time I do a, a trip. I do a fishing report at the end of the day, and it's it's my way of almost keeping my own personal log, but I do it through YouTube. And when I first started, guys would give me a bit of grief, and I said, like, come on, we've all been there. Like, I'm trying to help these guys out that are that are recreational fishermen, and you know, I said, you never know when, even as a charter guy, I'm having a hard time. But the rep guy that I've helped out is actually hitting them hard. And he's gonna he's gonna send me a text, and that happens. Yeah, there's a difference between a fishing report that becomes a brag report. Right. I got my twelve, and I'm done at nine thirty, and there's no information. No. Right? Versus, uh, I got my twelve at nine thirty, and this is what we use. It's yeah. Kind of, maybe not exactly the word, but they were on this today for us, and yep. I think. Maybe it is a little bit of a brag report because you want to know that separates you from the rest, yeah. which is which is okay. You earned it, you know. But it's not a total brag report. But as long as you can throw those guys some bones, yeah. I think I think uh, forget about what the other people. Say. Yeah, I don't know, and it's yeah. and now it's cool. Like I can tell you, like the, you the, the guys are we talk. Everyone's cool about it. It's helping helping people out because I think it's good for the fish. Yeah, you have a lot of good uh, videos and info info information on your stuff. I see it. So yeah, yeah I think it's actually it. really good to hear that fishing report and to hear from you and what you did when it's a grind. Yeah. I mean, when you go out there and you're banging them up in two or three hours, I mean, I don't want to say anybody, but a lot of people can go out and catch them when it's like that. So tell me how you're catching them when it's tough. And that's, I think, what people really want to know because, you know, a really good rectangler can go out there when the bite is just smoking hot. Yeah. They're going to do great. But what they want to know is what to do when things are tough. Yeah, you know, I think I think the biggest tip I've shared with guys is, um, you know, when we think about Toronto, we got this section called the drop. It's a huge drop off where it goes from, you know, call it 60, 80 feet to like 150 in a snap of the fingers. So guys love to, they love to troll that. When it's on, it's on. When it's off, it's dead water. Uh, and so I think the one thing I've probably t helped a lot of guys with is actually getting over the fear of turning their boat south and actually trolling out. And, you know, trolling out... And, you know, not powering up. It's just turning that boat and trolling out and, and running your spread. And Because you can often pick up kings in 250 and 300 and then just keep working it out. And then they start getting into coho and steelhead. And, and I think that is, I, I know, there's more guys that message me off saying, I would have 
burger with my clean beef boat. What I did to avoid myself, that, that piece, I think back to when I had my seven foot aluminum, I would never go out there because I was scared thinking it was something crazy out there. <laughs> it's just water. Yeah. It's just, just water. A little deeper. Yeah, yeah, just a little deeper. Away, but... You know, but as I say to them, make sure you tell someone you're going out there, have your radio on, have your cell phone and, and, and go enjoy because you can actually, you can actually find fish because who wants to keep going back and forth in the same water right. and, and, and not get any, not have anything going on. So I'd, I'd say that's the one thing. The, the other thing, uh, it's, you know, folk, guys will start out fishing and, and, you know, first thing in the morning, sun up when, you know what, you can't, almost can't do anything wrong. And then they want to leave that spread out uh, throughout the day. I, I personally believe that's when, you know, this fish gets spookier and I start putting my gear away from the boat, right? So, you know, I, I run a lot of slide divers. I want the gear away from the boat. Even if, you know, we've got a much stricter rod limit on, in, on the Canadian side, it's two per person. If I've only got, you know, two people plus myself, so I'm stuck to six rods. Tips I would share. I had small that day go on I was productive until I start getting into, into the evening shift. Yeah. One of the other things that you have to contend with is out of bluffers, I mean, it's Toronto. I mean, it's it's a busy, busy yep. port. There's a lot of traffic, especially if you think you're going to go out and run a 500 or something like that. Like, it's tough. Yep. There's a lot of traffic. So how do you navigate that, especially when we start talking about, you know, all these wreck anglers are out there on the weekend, and it, it gets busy out there. And that's a challenge that maybe people don't face so much, like in a place like Wilson or Alcott. Um, that you're facing every day out of Toronto. And then you have the Armada sailboats. That can <laughs> yeah. all the way down. I was you waiting that, for but, that, yeah. But there is a lot of sailboats on those yeah. These days. Yeah, I'm, days. Not, I'm not going to lie. Some days it's uh, you pull your hair out. Um, I, I'd say, honestly, on a... So we've got the major the major highway in Toronto. is called the 401 Highway. I joke like it's worse than that highway in rush hour on a weekend on yeah. this on this section of water. So you've, na- you've both nailed it. Yeah. Um, we have to adapt. So, uh, honestly, in a, you know, if I'm running a charter on a Saturday morning, Sunday morning, or even after Saturday or Sunday afternoon, I'll start out on that drop early morning. But I'm running a light spread. I'm running four or five rods. I'm trying to get those nice big kings early, get those hits um, while I can. I'm fighting with boats getting pushed around. It is what it is. Yep. Um, you know, you get a decent, you get a decent box. You know, you got some nice kings. I'll start to push out into deeper water. There's still fish in the deeper water, or I'll push into shallower water. Um, typically, I like to go deeper, uh, and then you know, if I, if worst case, I get them, I get the customer a mixed bag, and they're happy. But you know, last year, you know, anyone on social media would probably uh, on the Canadian side would know that uh, last year was a bit of a gong show with the amount of guy, uh, charter boats and big boats that were losing gear. Uh, you know, boats cutting in behind, and even wreck anglers having boats cut in behind. No one wants to lose gear. You you get a you get a you know a copper or weighted steel cut off. There's hundred hundred fifty dollars gone like that, right? And yep. The time to put it together, it's, so it just disrupts your whole day. Like yeah. the mojo goes, everybody gets mad. It, it is yeah. really, it just ruins the day when you have these events that happen. And it's especially when you got customers bit, on the, the boat. Whole they, thing just is like you just want to yeah, quit. Yeah, want to go in. You're just like, it's, it's a it's a day changer, really. You know, yeah, I know you're absolutely right, Pete. Like I remember for years, it used to be like put your big boards out. They'll, you know, kind of blocks that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't like so for me when I'm uh, when it's busy. I'm running, uh, I run the ninja boards, right? Because they whip them in and out super quick. Right. You know, I can let them out wider. I need to bring them in because the boat's really close. I can bring them within five, yeah. six feet of the boat. So yeah, that's a good idea. It's, a, it's adjusting to the uh, to the day. Would I rather run my Big John Otter boats every day of the week? But that doesn't work on the weekend. Right. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Mark, for stopping by. If people want to know more about you, I've got your website for your charter up there. It's kingslandingsportfishing.com. He talked about, too, you have an awesome YouTube channel. Where you really go through and just do a lot of just, hey, let me show you how this product works. And you really get into the kind of the nitty gritty and how things work. You do your reports on there as well. So if people that are up in the Toronto area want to know what's going on on that water, they get it all the time. Um, but then you've got your, your product we talked about right at the beginning as well. Yep. And that's going to be projectsalmon.ca. Absolutely. And I'd say, uh, you know, before COVID, you used to get lots of Americans come spend a week or two on the Canadian side and fish the Canadian water. I highly, you know, Pete, you've done it many times. Yep. Highly recommend it. It's a great fishery. Yep. Um, come come across the come across the lake. It's pretty easy to do, either by boat or by car. 
Uh, it's a cool fishery. Yeah, we we hope fun. to come back and see you this summer. Yeah, and I hope so. Now that's COVID things behind us and all that. Definitely. So hope cool. Time to Mark, compete. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Me. Mark, good seeing see you. See you later, Pete. Okay. All right, we got a new guest coming in here. It's Bill Schweitzer. Before we get that, though, let's uh, let's try to hit a couple of questions that are, are kind of more directed towards you, Pete. Uh, here's one from Ed Steinmetz. Ed says, uh, when you're running double divers, when do you run a regular size high diver in a mag? On the inside versus when do you run a mag on the outside and a mag on inside diver? Hi, Ed. Uh, normally, I'd say 98% of the time we're running our mags on the inside always and our regular size divers on the outsides. Of course, we vary them with settings and distance, but I've only ran four mag divers at once only a few times, and that's when we really just had like ultra deep fishing and you had to get, I mean, get down. So don't like to do it. Don't have to do it too often. But usually I'm, I'm regulars on the outside, mags uh, lower on my insides, probing depths. Um, but I, I like that setup a lot. Once you know, once those fish get down, I'd say 80 feet and deeper, at least some of them, mm -hmm. we start doing mags. And they create the mag divers really create a really good separation in the water too, because they pull a lot harder, go deeper. Uh, versus four regular side divers, which sometimes you get tangles and things like that. It really helps to uh, avoid tangles running those mags. And it's an underutilized tool, I think, in the Great Lakes. There's guys pulling those inside mag divers. Yeah, you want to keep them on your inside so that when you pick up a fish or not get right. tangled up, you got that. Right. That spoon up. They don't come up underneath your outsides typically. All right, let's bring in Bill. Come on on. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, gentlemen. Thanks How's it going? Show. Really Thanks very Bill. much. Pete Ellis. Right. Bill Schweitzer. Bill. So, Bill, you work for uh, New York Canals. I work for New York Canals, uh, the director of marketing, and uh, we run the New York State Canal System and uh, the 57 locks that make it up. Uh, it's funny, I've been listening to all the big lake talk, though. Uh, I used to have a trolling boat on Lake Champlain, okay. and I want to talk about the canals, but boy, I miss uh, I miss yeah. big lake trolling. It's uh, pretty great. I mean, a little different than the Great Lakes, but uh, it's the same thing, same thing. you know? Yep. Yeah. Um, but if I mention Lake Champlain, I might as well stay there. I'll give you like maybe two minutes on what the canal system is, and then I'll talk about our fishing program that affects Lake Ontario and a little bit of Lake Erie. Yeah, Sound please good? do that. Yeah, you, uh, so Bill just gave a, a speech on this, and again, we're at the uh, Greater Niagara Fishing and Outdoor Expo, and then we've got seminar rooms connected, and you guys are just doing seminars. Pete's done seminars. You do it like everybody in this building basically yep. has been doing seminars. So it's a great show if you want to learn stuff. So, Bill, why don't you go ahead and just give cool. us kind of an overview? Yeah, really good. Uh, I mean, we're one of, I think, 220 seminars they're doing, but we also have a booth right over here. Uh, but our main job is uh, the Canal Corporation runs the Erie Canal and the New York State Canal System. It's 500 miles of uh, inland waterway, connects to Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Uh, like the old song, it's uh, Albany to Buffalo, and it's still running. Um, there's the Champlain Canal that's 65 miles long that connects the Hudson River to Lake Champlain. And the Erie goes all the way to Buffalo, but you can go out the, to Ontario through the Oswego Canal. And then also, not too many people know this, there's a four-lock uh, canal called the Cayuga Seneca that connects the two bit largest finger lakes and uh, really great troll in there, landlocked salmon, uh, uh, lake trout. And so anyway, we're connected to Finger Lakes too, and all of that makes up 524 miles. Um, it's a heck of a lot of work to keep it open, but uh, 200 years ago, it made this state what it was, you know, made uh, New York State the Empire State. And nowadays it's more recreation, a lot of fishing, uh, tour boats, and uh, we also maintain the old towpath where the mules pulled the barges is now a multi-use uh, trail. It's a uh, part of the Empire State Trail. But uh, it's a canalway trail, and we, we run that too. So that's basically the canal system. And uh, but I'm here at the fishing show uh, to talk about uh, what we do with the Ontario Lake uh, tributaries. Uh, for years and years, we've really only been concentrated on navigation. I mean, we run the canal, and our nearly 200-year-old infrastructure is uh, you know it's hard to manipulate. But uh, we put a program together called Reimagine the Canals, and it was kind of like thinking outside the box. What else can we do with the canal? And uh, so we are doing these regulated or more careful releases of our water in the western part of the Erie Canal, and uh, the uh, in Niagara, Orleans, and Monroe County. Sandy Creek, Oak Orchard, Johnson Creek, and uh, 18 Mile Creek. We're releasing water in them to keep the uh, like the base flows going, and we're actually extending the season and uh, 
we can mimic a rain event and get them salmon to come in a little earlier. Can you, and so, can you explain that a little bit better? Like yeah. That the, the release yeah. of the water. And yeah. So, so uh, the Erie Canal drains into uh, the Lake Ontario, the north flowing Lake Ontario tributaries, okay. right? And normally we just pulled the plug and drained it when navigation season was over. The it was a, this, the canal, this, the Erie Canal. Erie right, canal. Right. You literally pull a plug on it. Well, yeah, I mean, I, just, I call it pull the just plug. drop it but, down to a certain uh, level? Right, so we, okay. uh, when our season's over late in the fall, we drain the canal to do a little ma winter maintenance. We have to fix up the locks. Uh, you know, the, all the infrastructure on the canal uh, is over 100 years old. Um, it was uh, the, the canal opened in 1918, so we're we're well over 100 years. Uh, but what we started to do was the waste weirs or the gates where we drain it. It's not really a plug; it's a gate that will drain it. Um, we started talking. We got a lot of feedback from the public, and uh, if we're a little more careful and we did a little manipulation to the infrastructure, we can release the water when they need water. So if there's low, it's been a drought in that late fall, we can give them a little needed water. And then during the season, when the salmon uh, and the brown trout and the steelhead are coming in, um, we can just maintain their flow so there's a good amount of high water. So you don't have to, uh, you know, the fishermen coming from, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania or wherever, uh, they don't have a guess and, and hope that they get, get good, good water. We can maintain a really good elevated flow. And then new this year. Uh, when we drain the canal, like I said, we're doing it in a kind of a sustained, longer period, so it's not this, this big rush of water. Uh, we actually let it fill up again, and we drained it again. So we ex extended the season for about two to three weeks in late November, early December. So you, you take it down from what to what? was you, When you say lower, lower, basically you're going from 12 foot to 4 foot or... Or I know it varies. Yeah, no. So, so uh, we get the the water in the Western Canal. The wet, the Western section of the Erie right. Canal is from the Niagara River, actually. Uh, so it is. We maintain 12 feet of depth for the boats for navigation, so that they know they have 12 feet of draft. Uh, and it probably goes down to about two or three or four feet. That low. Yeah, okay. yeah. And so, and then it and and it doesn't matter for us. It, you know, in the winter, nobody's on the water anyway. Uh, what matters is how we drain it for those uh, Ontario tributaries. So which tributaries does it affect? So ones? The, the ones we're doing now, and we're looking to expand it, we're kind of going slow and learning our lesson. We got a lot of help from DEC uh, and, uh, and other partners, uh, the guides in the area, uh, Oak Orchard, uh, uh, Tackle and Lodge, Ron Beerstein really got us really good feedback, yep. uh, but it's uh, Oak Orchard, Oak Orchard yeah. Creek, Sandy Creek, yep. uh, Johnson Creek, and yep. 18 Mile Creek. Okay. Those four tributaries are getting extra water from the Erie Canal, uh, bolstered flows. As so, you, so you could basically mimic a rainstorm and suck those fish into the system Absolutely. when it's when it's time. Absolutely, yeah. Right. And if uh, and if it's a sustained rain event, we can actually hold some water back. So I knew they did that at the Salmon River too. Yeah. Like they were able to control that flow. You know, it's getting antsy. We've had some drought. Yeah, they can control that and get get some water moving to get those fish up, and so the anglers can yep. can access yep. those fish. Right? I mean. It's, it starts really with the habitat, the, the uh, giving them this extra water and maintaining like an elevated flow just makes the, the fish can come further up the stream. And like you said, if it's low water, we can kind of entice them salmon to come in because we're giving them the water uh, and it keeps them in there longer. Right. So uh, more fish, better fishing conditions. You know, hopefully we're helping out the fishery as well as helping out the fishermen. That's the plan. Uh, one more thing we're doing, too. It's called the ACE program. It's access and conservation easements. Uh, we started giving all these tributaries of water. We thought we were, uh, you know, the, the, the hero. And everybody said, yeah, it's really great for the water, but there's not a lot of public access. So we're kind of um, the PFR program that DEC does. It's similar to that. And DEC is helping us. We uh, put together or we put aside a, a million and a quarter uh, dollars for the next 10 years. And we are... Um, purchasing land easements from uh, shoreside landowners and uh, for easements. DEC will control the easements, but we're trying to get a little more public access for fishing. That's exactly what our Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission does in, in Pennsylvania. They um, they use the Lake, Lake Erie permit dollars that are generated primarily for fishing Lake Erie and tributaries only, and there's millions of dollars in that. So they, they go around, yeah. and it's all tributaries, yep. and they try and coax the owners into either uh, signing an easement or purchasing their property yeah. uh, because of they want anglers to have access to all these fish they're stocking yeah. because 
you know, the electric and so go And as I entered the fishing business, right? like it. we started giving good you water. Control. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we got great feedback that we were making progress and the water was great. But then everybody said, hey, you know, what's the real problem around here. So we worked out with DEC. I mean, they're a fellow state agency with us, but there's only so much an agency can do. So we're following their lead and we got a little extra money and it's helping uh, the areas up there. And, and you know, and, and it's just these, you know, it's still the people's properties. So it's uh We'll just use 18 mile for an example. Yep. So, you know, lately we've been having these uh, bluebird you know, late summer Octobers. So is the DEC involved with the timing of you letting the water out as far as like, look, do they even look at the forecast? We're going to get rid of basically warm water. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. No, no, that. really, really, really good really question. Good so there was so much more than just, you know, I'm talking about the results of the program, right? right. Um, but there was a lot went into it. A lot. We had uh, we had a task force. We had uh, local guides, DEC, scientists, and all, all, all give us feedback. So the Sure. We did uh, uh, through Brockport, uh, the uh, the SUNY Brockport. We did creel studies, and we also, uh, uh, you know, uh, take the temperature of the water. Like none of, none of the, you know, we're not going to put warm water in there and cook the fish, like you said. So there's a lot to go into it before we do a release. Um, uh, it, that's an interesting side because, you know, I stream fish myself, and you don't think about that part, yep. right? But you guys are thinking about it, right? There's yeah. a method to madness, and you got all this planning and and when to pull the plug and yep. and why. And here you got the anglers just like, I, there's a run at 18 mile, let's go. But all this behind yeah, the scenes yeah. stuff is, is it's going interesting on. It's interesting because it's not natural. Yeah, yeah. You know, in Pennsylvania, we don't have the pull the plug thing. And all our, we have great steel at fishing, but no one pulls a plug to ignite a run. It's, yeah. We wait on God to say, right, let the rains come and the temperatures fall yeah. and then let the fish run where these guys are kind of playing that to some extent right? and it's and we're learning too it's it's really we get great feedback from the fishermen the public the the tackle shop owners and that um you know some of them are just like where's our water yeah. you know and then others say hey i saw some cloudy water today does that mean you're drinking now now we know we have a website that's dedicated to to just the release program and so we have them on a schedule and you can go to the website and uh, and check it out and kind of follow oh, you, when we're going to do the releases yeah where is yeah. that posted at so it's on uh the canal corporation website which is canals.newyork.gov okay. and just there's a little button on there that says fall fishing program and, and that's where you can find that out and it'll, it'll give you the dates you're tentatively going to yep. release that yep. water and so you can almost plan your fishing you trip can plan your fishing really. trip like that yeah and if Good you can't plan there. i was yeah, going to yeah. see maybe like yeah. he was going to angle you for some secret information. <laughs> yeah, well, we cover this up the mics. Like I thought it was. <laughs> what are we going to talk about? Canals or, you know. Well, the is thing good. is, that was part of the program. Like, it's, first of all, it's for the fish, right? Yeah. But the other thing is that, you know, being a fisherman, I did the same thing. I'm from uh, the Saratoga area, right? Uh, I'd have to drive out to Pulaski or Oswego, but you're hoping you get a good flow, you know? Yeah, um, what we're trying to do is a little more predictability where anglers don't have to guess. It's a busted trip, yeah. obviously, if, yeah. if that doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and you know, Mother Nature's not always cooperating when, no. you know, it was raining like crazy last fall, so we had to hold back a little bit. Um, when they need the water, we have it for them. And, uh, and then at the end of the season, we get to extend the season for a few more weeks because yeah. we drain it nice and slow. Are, and, these, are these low water levels that we have now, like, Ontario really impact any of this because it's all uh, south of it. So it, it, yes and no. It, so that it, it, it does affect us because uh, the the canal system is made up of seven rivers and five lakes. So there's a lot of water and a lot of water flow in different ways, and uh, it's a lot of water management. So yeah. so any any difference or our mother nature or, or events really affects what we have to do, and it's a it's a constant okay. game or battle, if you will, to, sure. to run the canal system. Yeah. Sure. So you talked about working with the DEC on this, and for those of you uh, maybe from the Midwest, DEC in New York is essentially what we would call a DNR, so that's that's basically what it is. But uh, who else are there other partners involved, maybe some nonprofits or anything like that that you're working with on this project? So really good question. So we just started to kind of reach out to those groups, Trout Unlimited and that. 
in one kind of educating what we're trying to do and then also saying, hey, what else can we do or how can we do it better or give us the feedback. The more feedback we get, the better we can tweak the system. And there's more tributaries out there we can affect. I mean, uh, the canal system isn't going anywhere. It's uh, 200 years old, you know, great for recreation, commercial shipping still goes on it. But I look at it as like another utility for the canal, you know, uh, that this you know, 200 year old infrastructure is actually affecting modern day uh, businesses, right? And and helping the fishing today, right? So, uh, but it's DEC, it's the local public, and we're just starting to get into those groups, the local Trout Unlimited, the statewide uh, group to get more feedback and get the word out what we're doing and to get, uh, you know, they'll know more of the landowners than we will. I mean, we're, we got a big job just running the canal. And even though we got the money set aside for the ACE program, I think our trial unlimited and those type of groups are going to help us uh, get the word out that, you know, Hey, you got a little piece of land and, you know, can, can you help us out? Yeah. So, so go ahead, Pete. Was, how, do you know, I'm curious how many, do you know how many vessels navigated the, just the Erie canal? Like, like last year so we do a traffic a report and our lock tenders i mean there's 57 locks on the system there's 35 on the erie canal so i can look in our system and see how many just came to the erie canal i think there were uh just up over 70,000 lockings uh last year that's how many times the the gates open on our locks so just that's per per lock well, yeah, that's all the locks combined, right? right? Yeah. So every time the lock opens, we count that as a locking, right? So you could have one fisherman going back and forth in between a couple locks, okay. you know, account for a lot of them. But uh, so we don't know the boat count on there, but uh, it's pretty darn busy. Um, there's never, uh, you're never really going to have to wait too long to get in or out of a lock. But uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting system because you'll go for stretches where you don't need a lock. There's no elevation change. And then you'll go where there are two or three locks to get up over a hill or get down a hill. So, uh it's uh, it's hard to say how many boats go through. What's the cost to do so the Erie the, Canal? Yeah, so it's it, the canal system is free. Okay. Uh, we used to have free. tolls years ago, uh, but uh, we're run by the New York Power Authority now that has three hydroelectric power plants on the system. And we found out when we took the tolls off, uh, uh, bo boating spiked a little bit. So uh, we are uh, it's free. It's uh, on demand, and you can uh, you open the lock for just one kayak. Or uh, several boats, or uh, or uh, any boat up to 300 feet. All our locks are 300 feet long and 45 feet wide. Okay. And it's uh, lock is uh, if you've never been through a lock, it's Leonardo da Vinci's invention, 500 year old technology. It's all gravity, no pumps or hydraulics. Boat comes in, we pull the plug, yeah. and uh, you know lower them down, or we take the water from the higher elevation and it fills up from the bottom and. It's an elevator for boats. I've only gone through the Welland Canal, yeah, but, yeah. but same but several several times. Yep, same. Know. So now that. that that lock is what, uh, it's, you know, it's maybe three, four times the size of our locks, but it's the same same principle. Same it's gravity. Yeah. Same way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're impressive. Like, the, if you go through the well in the canal, I mean, there's a lot of water. Yeah, for well, sure. I mean, when they drain the plug, there's yeah. a lot of water. Coming yeah. In there. Our locks are uh, the 300 feet long and 45 feet wide. So every time, every 10 feet is a million gallons of water. So uh, if we have, uh, like in Lockport, New York, the first lock you'll hit from Lake Erie, mm -hmm. uh, it's a 220 foot lock. So that's five million of water to put you through. Um, but again, All it's gravity. water from Niagara River, and we're just putting it back in the canal. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, efficient. It's big, and, yeah. It's yeah. So we're talking about a system that's 200 years old. Uh, you guys just started this fishing program recently. Where do you see the future of the canal system in New York? Where is it going? Well, so I know you're in a good business. So it's a great question. So we're actually coming up on the, on the uh, canal, the Erie Canal's bicentennial. It opened in 1825 and it's been running continuously ever since, right? So the World Canals Conference is coming to Buffalo in 2025. Uh, and we'll have kind of that world stage to kind of show off and talk about our birthday and talk about all the history. But really, we're kind of looking forward on what we can do what other what the fishing program is a really good example of how we're using the old infrastructure for something new and that's where we're going um it connects lake champlain and the hudson river and the atlantic ocean to the great lakes right uh you know water's a pretty darn good resource so uh we're looking you know sustainable practices um you know hydroelectric power there's 27 hydroelectric power plants on the canal system and so uh, we're really looking forward i i'm a marketing guy so i don't really know everything that we're doing um i just talk about the the, the successes but um our program reimagine the canals 
and our partners are really looking forward to the next hundred years. And I see it as, you know, big on recreation. The tourism just grows on the canal system all over. It's uh, such a different system. The Champlain Canal and the Southern Adirondacks is so much different than the Mohawk Valley which is so much different than the Western Canal out in this area, right? So uh, there's a lot of possibilities for it. Very good. Bill, yeah. appreciate you coming on. Was there something you wanted to talk about that we didn't ask you? So I wanted to say, um, so you're, is it Wisconsin? Are you from Wisconsin? I, I'm from Wisconsin, yeah. that's correct. Uh, so, you know, it's funny, you know, when I took this job, I never, you know, what does Wisconsin have to do with the canal, right? right. But uh, years ago, uh, iron ore and products from Wisconsin came down through the Great Lakes and came out through. We'd see boats now sure. from uh, from Wisconsin still on the system that are doing the Great Loop, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, I'm like, I'm, we're connected with Wisconsin. Yeah. You know, you, you, I'm from Albany, New York, and I work on the Erie Canal. Like, what would be our connection to that? But the Great Lakes are there, and uh, and we're part of them. So um, sure. I'm glad to be on your show, and awesome. thanks for letting me talk about our programs. Yeah, thanks for coming on. It was really interesting. Yeah. And I told Pete, I'm like. This guy's talking about tributaries. I know that was going to kind of scratch his itch. He likes talking about the trips. Well, it's like, boy, we're going to have to work for some questions here. But it all, it was great, actually. This was very informative. Oh, that's actually, great. Was, that's uh, great. You, and I tell you, and it's the opposite for me. I want to go back to Lake Champlain and start like, trolling uh, again. I say this stuff all day, but, you know, right. repetitive. This is this is old news, yeah. but it was, it was good news. Towards your biggest salmon, I got to ask you one fishing question. What's yeah. the biggest king salmon you caught in Lake Ontario or a tributary? So, uh, no fish stories. Like, yeah. Shit, okay? <laughs> Actually, the biggest salmon I ever caught was out of the Oswego River. Okay. I mean, Lake Ontario still, yep, but yep. geez, uh, and it's going back a few years. But I remember I had green line on. I had the fluorescent line because my eyes were no bad. Strand, and, probably. And, yep. And uh, uh, I, I was walking back with that fish, and I had another one on it, and I could hear, oh, there, there's that guy with the green line again. Everybody hated me, but it was a big king. I mean, it's, you know, maybe 30 pounds or something yep. like that, but uh, we were hitting everything that day. It was on one of those days where the light switch went on yep. and everybody's got it on. But that was probably my best day on the river. But uh, um, yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking that. I'm glad I got that. <laughs> really good to meet you, you guys. You. Thanks Thank so much. Take care. So, Pete, you showed up here a couple hours ago and you had like, I don't know, three or four pages of notes over there. I can guarantee you didn't get through half of it. So no. we're about to wrap up. Is there something that you wanted to talk about before we let this thing go? Not really. Just, well, I guess uh, for, for whoever's listening, come out. Um, if, if it's too late for this year, come out to this show next year. It's a really good show. Uh, it's probably one of the best fishing shows in North America. Maybe, maybe you get around a lot. Definitely a lot of education, a lot of manufacture, a lot of, you know, it's a really great fish head fishing event. So if you're listening and, and you're not going to catch it in 23, definitely come visit us up next year in 2024 to this uh, Niagara Expo fishing show. Yeah. Really, it's a great show. It's an awesome show. I appreciate you coming over and hanging out with us for a couple hours today. It was fun. Uh, I, I knew right off the bat with the Prisco thing that that was going to go off the rails, and I was just going to be along for the ride on that one. But uh, the rest of the show was awesome. I uh, appreciate you coming on and kind of helping out. And I, Like I was telling uh, Vince Pirlioni, earlier today it's just nice having a different perspective different set of eyes and, and just different questions that you're going to come up with and i'm going to come work up with so it was good having you with us and looking forward to having you on again tomorrow no uh we got trevor is going to be back tomorrow afternoon and we'll have casey tomorrow night so it should be fun yeah. um, appreciate everybody watching appreciate everybody listening we'll see you tomorrow another four hours of shows tomorrow from the greater niagara fishing and outdoor expo we'll see you then thanks chris